Hey guys, Tyler here. Star Trek The Next Generation, commonly abbreviated as TNG, is one of the most popular sci-fi shows of all time. Set roughly a hundred years after the events of the original Star Trek, many elements of the show, including characters like Jean-Luc Picard, as well as the iconic Starship Enterprise D, have disseminated into popular culture, exposing non-fans to the franchise through memes, casual references, and more. But a common consensus among Trekkies is that TNG took until its third season to find its footing. When introducing friends to TNG, many often say, just skip the first two seasons. But what exactly would you be missing by skipping out on the show's first 48 episodes? In this two-part video, I'll give you the rundown on the major events and themes of TNG's first two seasons, starting of course with season one. Let's get started. First, some background. Oh, and by the way, there will obviously be some spoilers, so be warned. By the time the fourth Star Trek film, The Voyage Home, was released in 1986, William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy's salary demands led Paramount to begin planning a new Star Trek show with unknown actors to increase the franchise's appeal in the cable TV and home video markets. TNG was initially pitched to the Fox network, but they couldn't guarantee a season order larger than 13 episodes, which was not enough to offset the show's enormous startup costs. The decision was then made to sell the series to first-run syndication, meaning that individual TV stations across the country would broadcast episodes without going through a network middleman. Franchise creator Gene Roddenberry was brought on to executive produce, and he hired a number of Star Trek The Original Series veterans like DC Fontana, David Gerald, Robert Justman, and Edward K. Milkus to form the core creative team. Rick Berman was also assigned as a supervising producer. The show was originally to be set in the 25th century aboard the Enterprise G, but this was later changed to the 24th century setting we're more familiar with. Concept artist Andrew Probert, who worked in the art department on the motion picture, was brought on in a leading design role. His designs came to define much of the TNG era, including the galaxy class itself. Everything seemed like it was falling into place, and by 1986, DC Fontana was commissioned to write the show's pilot, Encounter at Farpoint. Now when I say it's a pilot, that's not technically true. You see, a pilot is generally a standalone episode produced in the interest of getting a network to greenlight a show. But TNG's whole first season had already been ordered, so Encounter at Farpoint is simply the first episode. But frankly, this is semantics, and it really is just easier to call it a pilot, so that's what I'm gonna do, okay? Okay, at first, Roddenberry insisted on a one-hour pilot, but Paramount was keen on a two-hour pilot as they wanted something spectacular to launch the series. Roddenberry volunteered to extend Fontana's script to two hours, whereas previously the script only concerned the so-called mystery of Farpoint Station, a starbase built by a seemingly unadvanced civilization called the Bandy, Roddenberry's extended draft introduced the character of Q. Now it's at this point that I want to shift gears a little bit. For the remainder of this video, I'm going to take you on a journey. A journey through time and space. The final frontier. Okay, seriously, let's go through season one episode by episode, and I'll give you the rundown on each entry's contributions to the broader lore of the franchise. Crucially, I'll also highlight what makes each episode stand apart from the, let's call it, vibe of the remaining seasons and the remaining series. TNG's first episode, Encounter at Farpoint, is often listed as two episodes due to its length, but make no mistake, this is a single, unified episode. It's a grand episode in scale and scope, because it's our first glimpse of Roddenberry and Company's vision of the 24th century. Within minutes of Captain Picard boarding the Starship Enterprise, we're immediately introduced to Q and the threat that he poses to the crew's safety, 
or should I say, the threat he poses to their false sense of security. Because as I discussed in my video about the Lost Era, by the mid-24th century, Starfleet and the Federation as a whole has become, in many ways, complacent. Much like the United States at the end of the Cold War, the Federation at this point is pretty much the dominant power in the Alpha Quadrant, or at least in local space. Despite various border skirmishes with smaller powers like the Cardassians, there's a sort of Pax Romana throughout the Federation. Starting with Encounter at Farpoint, Q represents an obstacle to that peace. He's a harbinger of the dangers that deep space still poses to humanity. He says, go back. Humanity is too immature in Q's eyes to have gotten this far this fast. We get some lore about World War III, first referenced in the seminal original series episode Space Seed. As Q dons the uniform of a 21st century soldier to taunt Picard and the bridge crew, Picard accuses Q of being self-righteous and smug for prosecuting and judging humanity by our past actions. Q notes that prosecute and judge is an interesting concept before vanishing into thin air, but not without saying he'll be back. The Enterprise warps away from the area, but Picard orders all hands to prepare for a saucer separation. He orders Lieutenant Worf to command the saucer section en route to Farpoint Station as Picard and four subordinates head back to face Q. Picard is joined by Counselor Deanna Troy, an empathic human betazoid hybrid. Android Operations Officer Lieutenant Commander Data, Chief of Security Tasha Yar, and oh sh**, it's Miles O'Brien on the battle bridge before Q transports Picard, Troy, Data, and Yar to a late 21st century courtroom. Q is quite literally putting humanity on trial, our foremost crime being that we are a savage child race. And this courtroom is real, not an illusion. This motif of thought and matter converging pops up again later in the season. As Q continues to belittle humanity, Picard and Tasha Yar in particular give passionate defenses of Starfleet and humanity. But the question this scene makes the audience ask is, ultimately, does Q have a point? Picard relents to Q's insistence that humanity has been savage, in the past at least, but asks whether there is another test Q can administer to determine if this still holds true. 31 minutes into the episode, it completely switches gears and the Farpoint storyline actually begins in earnest. We meet Commander William T. Riker and Lieutenant Geordi LaForge, as well as Dr. Beverly Crusher and her son Wesley. Already, Wesley comes off as a pain in the ass. She's just shy around men she doesn't know. Wesley! A reputation that will follow him for years to come as he continually finds himself in situations that, frankly, no kid should be in. We get some foreshadowing to indicate that there's more to Farpoint Station then meets the eye. Picard and company finally arrive at the bandy homeworld of Deneb 4, commonly cited to be the fourth planet orbiting the real-world star Alpha Cygni 2600 light-years away. Not only do we learn that Picard and the Crusher family have a history, that Wesley's father Jack was killed in action under Picard's command of the USS Stargazer, but Riker and Troy have a romantic history as well. The command staff is finally united aboard the starship where they discuss the intel they have gathered not only on the Bandy situation, but on Q as well. We get a few inserted scenes here and there showing off Geordi's visor, Data giving Admiral Leonard McCoy a tour of the ship, and other little character moments. This episode also introduces us to the holodeck, a revolutionary new technology that combines virtual reality projection with transporter and replicator technology to create a truly walkable 3D environment. When the plot actually decides to pick back up again, Picard reveals that he wants to illegally detain Bandy's civic leader, Groppler Zorn, to get answers. But Q points out Picard's hypocrisy. <laughs> this is not how members of a civilized society behave. 
tisk tisk. In any event, an away team explores subsurface tunnels below the station to find more Blue's Clues. Suddenly, a strange starship appears in the skies of Deneb 4 and starts firing, except not on the station, but the Bandy Civilian Center. Zorn insists that he does not know why this ship is attacking, but the crew doesn't believe him. The Enterprise prepares to fire on the ship, but Q calls out this hypocrisy as well. What happened to peaceful dialogue and negotiation, huh? <coughs> Eventually, they figure out that the Bandy have captured an injured alien life form, feeding it just enough energy to keep it alive so it can morph into any shape the Bandy want. The ship in orbit is not actually a ship, but the alien's mate. The Enterprise helps free the trapped alien from its bonds, and the two life forms, colloquially referred to as star jellies, hold hands before flying away. How sweet. Q, dismayed that the humans have actually triumphed rather than letting the situation spiral out of control, takes leave, though he says that this is still not the last that humanity will see of him or his kind. So as you can probably tell, I've been kind of passively aggressively critical of this episode, and that's because it's, it's kind of a weak pilot. There's definitely some interesting ideas in Encounter at Farpoint, but it, overall it just has a really slow pace. It's almost like, oh, I don't know, this story should have been two separate episodes in the first place. While Q would go on to become a fan favorite, the introduction of this godlike being, alongside other arguably more grounded sci-fi elements in TNG, was to say the least, controversial. Notwithstanding the, you know, variety of godlike and non-corporeal aliens in the original series, but still, it, it was controversial. And while the star jellies are certainly unique in their design, in my opinion, everything about the bandy just comes off as being incredibly boring, to be honest. All in all, Encounter at Farpoint is a pretty accurate taste of much of what's to come in TNG Season 1. This isn't your grandfather's Star Trek. This is Star Trek, but in the 80s. And as a result, much of what we get in early TNG is trippy as hell, both in a good way and in a bad way. Oh, crap. This video is getting pretty long already. Okay, I wanted to give a more detailed view of Encounter at Farpoint because it is the pilot, it sets the tone. But for the remainder of Season 1, I'm just going to go over the synopsis of each episode and let you in on the little lore bits. But keep in mind, all of this has a point. Each of these lore tidbits informs something larger about not only TNG's contributions to the broader Star Trek canon, but the context in which each episode was made. Episode 3, The Naked Now, is effectively a remake of the TOS episode, The Naked Time, in which the Enterprise is infected with an infectious infection that radically lowers the crew's inhibitions. Except this episode is sexier. I am programmed in multiple techniques, a broad variety of pleasuring. Yet still as, if not more, campy and cringe. I'm a woman. I haven't had the comfort of a husband. A man. Super cringe. Episode 4, Code of Honor, is often referred to as the racist one. Yeah. In this, Tashiar is kidnapped by members of an alien race who are all portrayed by black actors in what can only be described as stereotypical tribal African costumes and roles. Even if that all sounds circumstantial to you, just note that Almost everyone involved with the production who has since spoken about it has practically disowned it. Jonathan Frakes called it a racist piece of shit. Sir Patrick Stewart called it embarrassing. And Brent Spiner and Michael Dorn cited it as the worst episode that they ever filmed. Just skip it for the love of God. Episode 5, The Last Outpost, introduces the Ferengi who are supposed to be TNG's big bad, much like the Klingons were in TOS. Except, 
that didn't really pan out. The Ferengi were envisioned by Roddenberry as an allegory for Wall Street venture capitalists, and their economic system is definitely derided in dialogue and early instance of open anti-capitalism in TNG. I believe the analogy refers to the worst quality of capitalists. The Ferengi are believed to conduct their affairs of commerce on the ancient principle caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. The problem is that the Ferengi in this episode come off as pretty damn goofy, and to many, they, well, they embody unfortunate anti-Semitic stereotypes. Episode 6, Where No One Has Gone Before, is actually one of my favorite episodes of the season. It offers instrumental character development for Wesley, who, all joking aside, actually, I think, gets a lot more than he deserves. In this episode, a mysterious alien called a Traveler alters the Enterprise's warp engines to take it to the Triangulum Galaxy, and eventually to the end of the universe, where thought and matter collide. See, I told you that motif would show back up. And the crew has to figure out how to get back home as the Traveler's health declines. Long story short, Wesley is, again, instrumental in helping the crew get home. The science of this episode is questionable, to say the least, but it does capture and focus the surreal vibe of TNG Season 1 in a more entertaining and thought-provoking way than a lot of other episodes. Also, you may have noticed up to this point that LaForge has been serving as a helmsman rather than chief engineer. That's because he didn't become chief engineer until Season 2, and in the meantime, no single chief engineer is actually introduced. It's kind of like a revolving door. In Episode 7, Lonely Among among us, the Enterprise transports delegates from the warring worlds of Antica and Soleil to a peace conference. But these aliens just can't stop trying to kill each other. What the hell? <sighs> Sorry, wrong species. And to boot, an alien virus takes over the Enterprise's computers and the minds of the crew. Interestingly, this episode also serves as the beginning of Data's fascination with Sherlock Holmes. But Riker also says, We no longer enslave animals for food purposes. Hmm? Though this isn't really a statement about humanity being vegan in the future. It's really more so, I, I would say, about replicator technology having kind of made factory farming obsolete. But speaking of consuming animals, at the end, we learn that the Antikins are preparing a meal. They're preparing to eat a large reptile, and one of the Soleil delegates is missing. Yeah. Unsurprisingly, Paramount got quite a few angry letters from fans complaining about this implied cannibalism. In episode 8, Justice, Wesley is sentenced to death for falling into a flower bed on a planet ruled by a religious cult. Oh no! Oh please no! These people are, let's say, very sex positive, but also incredibly authoritarian. The death penalty is the punishment for all crimes, no matter how insignificant. Long story short, the crew bandies about the Prime Directive for 45 minutes before screwing off, preventing Wesley from being executed for touching grass. Episode 9, The Battle, is another one about the crew getting infected by an alien something or other, except this time it's just Picard. But in this episode, we learn some more about the Ferengi, the Stargazer, and the fact that by the 24th century, the common cold and headaches have both been cured. That sounds nice. In episode 10, Hide and Q, Q returns to test the Enterprise in another one of his games. And he ups the ante by giving Riker his powers. All things considered, this episode is not really that bad at demonstrating how Trek expertly navigates ethical dilemmas, especially since Riker must restrain himself and let an innocent child die. John Delancey is a delight as always, and this episode further develops the story thread regarding humanity's possible ascension into Q-like beings far in the future. Episode 11, Haven, introduces Counselor Troy's mother, Loaxana, played by Gene Roddenberry's wife, Majel Barrett. Troy is to be wed to a man named Wyatt 
in an arranged marriage. The wedding falls through, of course, but we do get one interesting tidbit. It confirms, at least according to the Betazoid understanding of the universe, that all consciousness is connected and is fundamentally part of the same thing. They were really hammering home on this thought and matter, you know, converging kind of thing in season one. Thank you for the drinks. Episode 12, The Big Goodbye, is a holodeck <laughs> Episode 12, The Big Goodbye, is a holodeck adventure. He's not from around here, is he? Uh, no, he's not. Uh, he's, uh, he's from South America. Yeah. That becomes even more thrilling when Picard, Data, Crusher, and Totally Not a Red Shirt get trapped inside with the safety protocols off. One of my biggest takeaways is Whew, man, the sexual tension between Jean-Luc and Beverly can be cut with a knife. They, okay, okay, let's, let's kind of calm down for a minute. Yes, they do remain friends throughout the run of TNG, but you have to wonder if this is all building up to something. Maybe in Picard season three? The episode is also the first mention of the London Kings baseball team, referenced in DS9 by Benjamin Sisko. Episode 13, Data Lore, introduces us to Data's brother, Lore, who is reactivated when the Enterprise visits the planet where Lore and Data were built. Lore has a much stronger grasp on human emotions than Data and uses this to manipulate people, until he is, of course, spaced towards the end. Throw it out the airlock. Interestingly, this is an early instance of an internal continuity issue, as it's stated that Data does not use contractions. But not only does he use contractions in previous episodes, he uses one at the end of this one as well. I don't know, man. I, I consider that stuff to just, I would just chalk it up to like production errors. They happen. They happen. These things are made by humans. Shut up, Wesley. In episode 14, Angel One, the Enterprise visits a, another planet with a heavy matriarchal society as the crew battles yet another space virus. And those seem to be happening quite a lot. Anyway, Riker leads an away team to inquire about possible survivors of a freighter crash. It turns out there are indeed survivors, but they refuse to leave because they're attracted to the women on this planet, and they are charged with fomenting dissent against the government. Riker gets the spotlight this time and delivers a passionate speech about equality. My main takeaway, this episode is very 80s. Oh wait, am I, am I supposed to be rating these episodes like out of 10? I, I can't. I actually kind of agree with the IMDb user ratings for each of these episodes. <laughs> this one's pretty forgettable. Episode 15, 11001001, introduces us to the Binars, a species composed of symmetric pairs of cybernetically enhanced humanoids. The Binars, initially brought on to upgrade the Enterprise's computer systems, hijack the Enterprise to back up the data on the Binars central computer as their homeworld is threatened by a supernova. The episode is an early exploration of holodeck relationships and just how real these programmed synthetic minds can be. And it's also an early showcase of Data's painting hobby. Oh my god. Episode 16, Too Short a Season, should perhaps instead be called Too Long an Episode. Okay, seriously, the plot is this guy who's like a Federation diplomat takes an anti-aging drug and the side effects cause his organs to fail. I mean, that, that, that is really it. That, that is the whole episode. Benjamin Button looking at In episode 17, when the bow breaks, Wesley and the other children on the ship, oh yeah, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it already, there are families aboard the Enterprise in deep space. Pax Romana, guys. The children are kidnapped by a race that has become infertile, but they're released after the Enterprise fixes the planet's ozone layer. That's also it. I hate that teacher and I hate calculus. Everyone needs an understanding of basic calculus, whether they like it or not. Why? In episode 18, Home Soil, the Enterprise discovers a silicon-based life form on a planet that's being terraformed. And these life forms call their carbon-based observers ugly bags of mostly water. In episode 19, Coming of Age, Wesley takes an entrance exam to Starfleet Academy. His fellow peers are a competitive human girl named Oriana. Wait, no. 
Oleana, a typically stoic Vulcan girl named Tashanik, and the Vape God. A Benzite named Mordok. This episode has one of the most obvious twists ever towards the end, but it's still enjoyable. This is actually like a really strong entry in the season, I think. I am Rondon, you despicable melanoid slime one! Liar! I swear, man, Wesley just, he, he's, he's become such a meme, but his character arc is so much more nuanced. In episode 20, Heart of Glory, the Enterprise rescues three Klingon survivors of an attacked, stolen freighter in the Romulan neutral zone. Worf's loyalties to Starfleet are tested when the Klingons try to goad him into turning against the Federation. In TNG, the Federation and the Klingons are at peace, but these Klingons are fugitives who miss the good old days. Oh, the good old days of brown face. <laughs> One other thing that stands out about this episode is that we get more lore about Geordi's visor. And there's even what sounds like a rearrangement of TOS film music. One of the Klingons also makes an offhand reference to the Klingon homeworld, which is called Kronos, but he calls it Kling. They were still working some things out at this point. In episode 21, The Arsenal of Freedom, LaForge commands the Enterprise as Picard and an away team are trapped on a planet defended by an automated weapons system. This outing offers an early example of Riker's commitment issues when it comes to you know, not accepting his own Starfleet ship command. He's content to just stay first officer. We also get some more lore about Beverly's grandmother. Huh. Where else has Beverly's grandmother been featured? No! You're not Nana. Nana's dead. Leave her alone! Episode 22, Symbiosis, is all about drugs, drugs, drugs. The Enterprise rescues a freighter crew and their precious cargo, which is full of drugs. It's the 80s, man. Just say no. <laughs> the freighter crew is actually composed of members of two societies. The Breckians, who keep the Ornarans hooked on drugs. The Breckians deny the Ornarans their cargo as they argue their payment was lost with the freighter. And Picard, in a grand demonstration of the Prime Directive's cultural relativism, refuses to give the Ornarans medical assistance for their impending withdrawal. Okay, I, I, I make fun of this, but it, we'll, we'll see that Picard, he kind of knows what he's doing a little bit. He only goes so far as to break them off from the Breckians' control, because at this point the Breckians are pretty much bragging about how they have kept the Ornarans dependent. This is not violating the Prime Directive, Picard concludes. Funny enough, we do get a follow-up to this episode with the Season 3 episode of Lower Decks, Trusted Sources, where we learn that the Ornarans have a new addiction, physical fitness. How wholesome. But honestly, one of the most memorable and memeable interactions from this episode is between Wesley, Data, and Tasha Yar. Voluntary addiction to drugs is a recurrent theme in many cultures. Wesley, no one wants to become dependent. So why do people start? Drugs can make you feel good. But it's artificial. It doesn't feel artificial until the drug wears off. Before you know it, you're taking the drug not to feel good, but to keep from feeling bad. All you care about is getting your next dosage. Nothing else matters. I guess I just don't understand. Wesley, I hope you never do. Episode 23, Skin of Evil, is notorious for killing off Tasha Yar, who you might have noticed I haven't been talking about much in this video. That's because her character was sorely underdeveloped, which I honestly think is a huge shame, because I think she showed so much potential from the start. Being from an abandoned Earth colony outside the Federation's jurisdiction where their utopian socialism didn't reach, and so the colony was plagued with 
poverty, and crime, violence, and of course, drugs. Denise Crosby has also stated that another reason she left the show is because Rick Berman is a sexist asshole. But Tasha's lack of character development is commonly cited as the primary reason for her departure. In the episode, Tasha is unceremoniously killed by a sludge monster named Armus, who threatens to do the same to other crew members, although they are eventually rescued. It, it can be argued, I guess, that this kind of random, unceremonious death for a character, this is the first permanent death of a character, a main character on uh, Star Trek, that it's more realistic. But, you know, it, it doesn't, it just doesn't feel right, because, man, I mean, she had so much potential, man. Justice for Tasha Yar. Episode 24, We'll Always Have Paris, introduces a phenomenon called the Mannheim Effect, an experiment gone wrong that sends a ripple across a multi-thousand light year radius of space that causes brief time loops. It's like Star Trek's version of the snap, except with deja vu rather than genocide. This sci-fi concept in and of itself is pretty interesting, I'd say, but it's buried deeply under a far less interesting plotline of Picard reuniting with an old flame. All in all, pretty forgettable. Episode 25, Conspiracy, is a huge step up from the previous entry. In fact, it's often regarded as the best episode of the season. In the episode, the crew unravels a conspiracy within the ranks of Starfleet Command, and they discover numerous high-ranking officers have been infected by neural parasites. Side note, Conspiracy is the first episode to feature a bullion, and it's also the first episode of TNG where the crew returns to Earth. Picard and Riker eventually track down the mother creature and kill her, neutralizing the threat. Except, at the end of the episode, Data reports that a homing beacon has been sent from Earth to an unexplored distant sector of the galaxy. This was originally to tie in with the introduction of the Borg in the second season, and indeed the subsequent episode, The Neutral Zone, serves as further prelude to First Contact. In The Neutral Zone, after the Enterprise revives three 20th century humans from cryogenic stasis, the ship is ordered to the Romulan Neutral Zone, where they find multiple Federation colonies have been completely wiped off the map. The Federation thinks that the Romulans are to blame, but towards the end of the episode, the Romulans reveal that several of their colonies have also been disappeared. Have also disappeared. English. Conspiracy and the Neutral Zone are deemed by Enterprise writer and producer David A. Goodman as being the first truly watchable episodes of the next generation. Paraphrasing a little bit. Unfortunately, the 1988 writer's strike nixed any plans to connect the neural parasites referred to in Star Trek Online as the Bluegills with the Borg. And in canon, their true origins remain a mystery. TNG Season 1 was rather chaotic behind the scenes. Roddenberry's tight grip on the franchise led him to personally rewrite the scripts for the first 15 episodes to align them with his uber-utopian dogmatic belief that in the 24th century, humans would have eliminated workplace interpersonal conflict. Unlike the frequent crusty banter between Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the original series, in TNG, conflict between human officers was to come primarily from outside sources. While this rule was relaxed later on, in season one, it made writing dramatic television difficult. The turnover of writers in season one was nothing short of legendary, and Gerald and Fontana quit after disputes with Roddenberry. Gerald even claims that Roddenberry's attorney, Leonard Meislish, destructively interfered with the show, including removing a gay couple that Roddenberry had promised would be included. Roddenberry was personally distraught with how much trouble Meislish had apparently caused, including chasing all of Jean's friends away. But not everything was so tense. Shit 
Episodes like Code of Honor notwithstanding, Jonathan Frakes has said that season one was a time when the show took more risks, many of which eventually paid off, like Data's fascination with Sherlock Holmes, the introduction of lore, foreshadowing the Borg, and stories involving both the Klingons and the Romulans. While the show was, once again, fairly controversial when it first premiered as fans unfavorably compared it to TOS, and it was criticized for subpar special effects and lots of episodes being resolved with the deus ex machina of Wesley saving the ship, the first season was regularly watched by over 10 million households per episode. Oh, and would you look at that? Justice was the second most viewed episode of the entire season. So should you actually skip TNG season one? Well, to be honest, I, I do think that you can enjoy the show by doing this. Much of the meat that makes TNG memorable comes more so in the later seasons, the middle seasons in particular. That said, if you're a completionist, then binging season one won't hurt you except maybe dying a little bit from cringe. But in my opinion, a reasonably condensed viewing order would include the relevant episodes Encounter at Farpoint, Where No One Has Gone Before, Hide and Hue, The Big Goodbye, Data Lore, Coming of Age, Heart of Glory, The Arsenal of Freedom, Conspiracy, and The Neutral Zone. For quality, maybe throw in 11001001, and for context about Tasha's death, skin of evil. Originally, this was supposed to be a single video exploring TNG seasons one and two, but god, there's no way in hell I could have done that. And season two has an even more distinct vibe from season one, if you will, so it probably is best left for another video. My question to you is, how soon would you want me to talk about it? Because I, you know, I had to watch all of season one for this video. I've got to watch all of season two. It is a little bit shorter because of the writer's strike, but uh, honestly, I, I, I look forward to covering it. So is, is that something that you would want to see me cover sooner than later? Let me know down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Hey guys, Tyler here. In a previous video, I examined the lore of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 1. I offered a rundown of the major events and themes, and even highlighted numerous behind-the-scenes controversies during its production. While TNG is considered by many to be peak sci-fi, its first two seasons have garnered a reputation by many as being incredibly awkward, at least the first one, the second one not so much. But in continuing my analysis of this series, it only makes sense that I would follow up season one with season two. You don't have to have watched the previous video to enjoy this one, but today I'll dive into the lore and themes of TNG season two and answer the question, are both of these seasons actually that bad? Let's find out. In part one, I established some background about the show's origins and early development. I won't rehash it here, but I do want to provide some insight on another unproduced series that heavily influenced early TNG. In 1977, 
Eight years after Star Trek The Original Series went off the air, Paramount Pictures announced plans to launch a new television network to rival ABC, CBS, and NBC. Following the rapid explosion of Trek's popularity in syndicated reruns, Paramount greenlit a sequel series to serve as the network's flagship program. The studio brought franchise creator Gene Roddenberry back in as a writer and executive producer. The series would have been called Star Trek Phase Two and featured a refitted Enterprise on a new five-year mission. By the summer of 1977, a pilot was written and ready to be filmed that fall, and construction on sets had even begun. Ultimately, however, the series and the new network deal itself both fell through due to lack of advertiser interest. At first, it seemed like Phase 2 was completely dead, but due to the success of Star Wars, Paramount opted to revive the project as a full-fledged theatrical release, which eventually became Star Trek the motion picture. Many elements of Phase 2, including the Enterprise refit and several new characters, were carried over. While the subsequent TOS movies took something of a thematic departure from the motion picture though, Phase 2's influence on the franchise was far from over. Just as with my Season 1 video, what I'd like to do now is provide an episode-by-episode -episode rundown of Season 2's plot synopses, while pointing out how each episode contributes to the broader lore of the franchise. Oh, and by the way, if it wasn't obvious, there will be spoilers. Naturally, we'll start with Episode 1, The Child. In this episode, Counselor Deanna Troy is impregnated by an alien life form without her knowledge. Off to a fantastic start we are. This alien life form, depicted as a ball of energy, is there to experience what it's like to be a humanoid, or even just corporeal, all the way from conception to death. This episode was actually adapted from a script written for Phase 2, which would have featured Lieutenant Ilea becoming pregnant. Something I do actually feel is worth giving this episode credit for. When the senior officers discuss how to address this violation, abortion is considered a valid option, which some may say is a bold choice for 1988. However, Deanna ultimately chooses to deliver the baby. Not, not her, she chooses to have the baby. Other people will deliver it. You know, Dr. Pulaski, I'll get to her. The discussion ends when, and only when, Deanna makes the choice for herself. That's kind of the point of right to choose. The child, whom Deanna names Ian after her late father, matures to at least the age of four in a matter of days. He goes to school, holds conversations, and even experiences what it's like to burn oneself, all while enigmatically avoiding an explanation for why he's really here. Finally, he does, just in a flash, decide that it's time to go, and just like that, he is gone from this plane of existence. Further traumatizing Deanna in what could uncharitably or perhaps just accurately be described as a sick, twisted experiment. But alas, it's all okay because the life form telepathically gives Deanna all the answers the crew, and thus the audience, need. In one scene at the end of the episode, yeah, this script is not paced very well in my opinion. Yeah, this episode is rather uncomfortable, but to say that it's inconsequential is not totally fair. Because after all, this is also the first episode to feature a staple of the show that goes on to profoundly affect the relationship between all of our beloved characters. I'm talking, of course, about Riker's beard, which Jonathan Frakes grew out between filming seasons one and two. Roddenberry liked it for the character so much that Frakes decided to keep it rather than shave it off, changing the course of history for... <laughs> changing the course of galactic history forever. The child also introduces Guinan, played by Whoopi Goldberg, who gets an A-plus introduction, in my opinion. Don't you always do what's expected? I try. Sometimes the game is to know when to consider yourself before others. 
10 forward Guinan's Barr on the Enterprise, and Dr. Catherine Pulaski, played by Diana Maldor, who was also in a couple episodes of the original series. Pulaski replaces Dr. Beverly Crusher for season two, as Crusher has left the ship to head Starfleet Medical, though her son Wesley chooses to stay behind and continues to don his pajamas on the bridge. Wesley kind of starts to come into his own in the season, though uh, honestly the better part of his character development, in my opinion, comes in, you know, season three and beyond. But, you know, baby steps. But nevertheless, he has become a valued member of the crew, and it's actually kind of sweet to see all these senior officers commit to communally parenting Wesley while his mother is off the ship. As for why Dr. Crusher isn't there, well, Gates McFadden, who played Dr. Crusher, has stated that she was fired from the show for criticizing some of the writing in season one for being sexist. She was generally vocal in her opposition to many of the decisions that the studio had made, but her dismissal still came as a shock to the entire cast, thanks to a letter writing campaign from fans, as well as support from Patrick Stewart and Rick Berman, ironic given that Berman is allegedly responsible for running Denise Crosby off of the show, McFadden was brought back for the remaining seasons after season two. I know that people like to dunk on Pulaski, but at the end of the day, I think she's a perfectly fine character. I like Crusher and all, I'd prefer her. I think that she definitely meshes better with the rest of the crew, which is probably a reason it's a good thing that she was brought back. But from a writing standpoint, Pulaski's skeptical attitude towards Data and other artificial life forms, and her arc to become more tolerant of our beloved android officer, is quite compelling. It's pretty realistic, in my opinion. It probably represents the way that a majority of Federation citizens feel about artificial life forms. Not only does she mispronounce his name and kind of brush it off the first time that he corrects her, she also calls him it in episode two and constantly doubts his capacity for human insight. But once again, while the Enterprise is a highly unique environment filled with people who are not only tolerant of Data but embrace him, Pulaski's interactions with him do lead to some of the best writing in season two, which we will get to later. In episode two, where silence has lease, the Enterprise comes face to face with a giant face in space. This is Nagilam, an immortal non-corporeal intelligence from another dimension who threatens to kill half the crew just out of pure curiosity as to how the other half would react. Picard is, of course, faced with a grim decision because this thing is pretty powerful. And at one point, the only viable option seems to be to self-destruct the entire ship. Remind me why there are children on board again? There's also this red shirt who has one of the most memed deaths in TNG. This episode is pretty dang weird, but I do think it has a great ending. Picard, finding it difficult to trust what is real or not, waits until the very last few seconds to cancel the auto-destruct sequence, leading to this exchange between Riker and Wesley. He sure held that bluff to the last second, didn't he, sir? Was he bluffing? Episode 3, Elementary, Dear Data, is a huge step up even compared to the previous two entries, especially compared to Episode 1. In order to test Data's limitations when it comes to creative problem solving, Data, Geordi, and Pulaski participate in a Sherlock Holmes holodeck simulation, whose parameters include an AI-generated adversary capable of defeating Data. Note that Geordi phrases this as capable of defeating Data, not capable of defeating Holmes. As a consequence, the ship's computer gives the Professor Moriarty character sentience. Just... just gives him sentience. Not only that, but enough awareness and skill to threaten the safety of the Enterprise herself. AI-generated art in my Star Trek? Say no to NFTs! <laughs> Artistry, not algorithms. 
That's, that, that's lame. Hollow deck mechanics are explained in more detail in this episode, which is iconic not only for the introduction of the Moriarty character, but for taking Data's fascination with Sherlock Holmes to the next level. Episode 4, The Outrageous Okana, features a rogue freighter captain named Captain Okana, who inadvertently brings the Enterprise into the middle of an interplanetary dispute. I'm sorry, I know that Okana has some fans out there, including the uh, creative team behind Lower Decks, but this episode is honestly just cringy from start to finish. I'm sorry. The attraction that I have for you. The B-plot about Guinan helping Data understand humor is far more interesting in my opinion. Perhaps the joke was not funny. No. The joke was funny, it's you, Data. But I will give this episode props for offering some of the funniest lines of season two. So, if you put funny teeth in your mouth and jump around like an idiot, that is considered funny. Episode five, Loud as a Whisper, features a famed mediator named Reva, who is brought in to settle another dispute on the war-torn planet of Solias V. Reva is a member of the Ramatesian royal family who have a genetic condition that renders them deaf. But rather than simply having an interpreter, the Chad Reva <laughs> has a chorus of three telepaths who express his thoughts and emotions verbally. Spoiler alert, the chorus gets killed in what is probably one of season two's worst VFX shots. This understandably causes Reva some intense emotional pain. Not only were these people his interpreters, they were his lifelong friends. And they just get and they just get CGI'd away. But the solution that the Enterprise crew comes up with for Reva to still be able to mediate the conflict is honestly pretty genius. He will teach both sides of the Civil War sign language. Overall, this episode is not terrible, but it doesn't really have any long-lasting consequences for the franchise. Episode 6, The Schizoid Man, features Data's so-called grandfather, Dr. Ira Graves, mentor of Dr. Noonien Soong, who created Data. Graves is very ill and close to death, but he still has plenty of time to be horny and sexist at the same time. For a doctor, you're not a bad-looking woman. Go on, gorgeous, spit it out. Women aren't people. They're women. Upon his death, Graves uploads his consciousness into Data's body, leading to some extremely awkward conversations. I can love you now, the way I always wanted to. Except we've got that. Dr what's the literary term? Dramatic. Dramatic irony. Well, that didn't work. Until he ultimately comes to his senses and offloads his knowledge onto the Enterprise's computer banks before Data's true personality is lost forever. Classic mind uploading plot, super cringe execution. Episode 7, Unnatural Selection, is effectively a remake of the TOS episode, The Deadly Years. All the way down to. <laughs> All the way all the way down to Pulaski sharing McCoy's distaste of the transporter. In the episode, the Enterprise investigates the deaths of the crew of the USS Landry, who have all died of old age. They discover that this was caused by a virus, which they trace back to Darwin Station on the planet Gagarin 4, evidently an exception to the Federation's ban on genetic engineering, since they conduct research on genetically enhanced children. Mass Effect anybody? Fun fact, this episode is also the first appearance of the Miranda class in TNG which many people consider to be one of the most overused ship models, but I like it. <laughs> In episode 8, A Matter of Honor, as part of the officer exchange program, Riker serves as first officer aboard a Klingon ship, except several of his crew members are skeptical of his loyalties, even attempting to engage the Enterprise in battle. This episode is a really good exploration of alien psychology, as the Benzite Ensign Mendon, not to be confused with the vape god Mordok, 
temporarily assigned to the Enterprise, is incredibly eager to please, but also withholds critical information about a subatomic life form that is eating a hole through the Enterprise's hole. Uh, e eating a hole through the Enterprise's hole. Hole. Huh. The, the hole of the f***ing ship. He does so in an effort to first identify a solution as per Benzite protocol, but Picard reminds him, this is America. Wait, no. This is indeed a Federation vessel, not just a Benzite vessel. Episode 9, The Measure of a Man, is often hailed as not only one of the best episodes of Season 2, but also of TNG, of the franchise, and of sci-fi as a whole. And for good reason. A Starfleet cyberneticist named Bruce Maddox wants to disassemble Data in order to study him and make more Datas, and he has the backing of Starfleet Command. Picard, incensed that Starfleet would want to take away one of his best officers, pledges to defend in a court proceeding not only Data's right to remain on the Enterprise, but his rights as a person. This is a big deal because it will invariably set precedent for how artificial life forms are treated under Federation law, something that the Federation is very reluctant to abide by as we see in other installments of Trek. Riker is put in the unenviable position of having to argue that Data is property or risk losing his Starfleet commission, even though Riker personally agrees that Data is a person. Pinocchio is broken. Its strings have been cut. We learn that Data's positronic brain has a memory capacity of 800 quadrillion bits, which is equivalent to 100 petabytes, 40 times as much as the human brain. Picard almost loses the case, but with some sage words from Guinan, he realizes what else is at stake. If Maddox wins, then Starfleet is effectively greenlighting the potential creation of a slave race. Machines, yes, but intelligent, self-aware beings who are treated as second-class citizens. This episode brilliantly walks the fine line of questions of personhood when it comes to AI, and thus has earned its place as one of the most well-regarded episodes of Star Trek. We have all been dancing around the basic issue. Does Data have a soul? Does this unit have a soul? Episode 10, The Dolphin, <laughs> sounds like a Bostonian, is a love story between Wesley and a young girl, the heir to the throne of a planet bogged down in centuries of civil war. But not only that, she and her governess turn out to be members of a non-corporeal race, the Elasimorphs. Enjoying this episode really depends on how you feel about Wesley Crusher being given so much screen time, but it does at least have a kaiju fight. I don't think this is my style. Shut up, kid. Episode 11, Contagion, introduces the Iconian Gateways, technology from an ancient, purportedly extinct civilization called the Iconians. After a computer virus from an automated Iconian probe destroys the USS Yamato and infects the Enterprise and a Romulan warbird, the Enterprise must find a way to stop it before the Romulans can gain control of the gateway technology. By the way, commanding the Romulan vessel is Taurus, played by Carol Seymour, who voices Dr. Karen Chakwas in Mass Effect. You will withdraw or I will be forced to destroy your ship and your away team. I sincerely hope you're kidding, Corporal. Your real action usually ends with me patching up crew members in the infirmary. Whew. Just had to take a break. I forgot to charge my mic, and I had to tape that poster back up, and I had to feed my cats. It was a whole thing. I also want to take this opportunity to remind you guys that, according to my analytics, the vast majority of people who watch these videos are not subscribed. That's got to change. If you're enjoying this video and you want to see more content like it, hit that subscribe button so you won't miss my future uploads. And click that bell icon so you actually won't miss future uploads, because the subscription button, you know, it, it only goes so far. Now, back to the video.
Episode 12, The Royale, is a steep drop from the previous entry. The Enterprise comes across a previously uncharted planet called Theta-8 and investigates the wreckage of a long-lost ship called the Charybdis, which went missing after its launch in 2037. Aliens on Theta-8 have recreated the Hotel Royale, the setting of a poorly written mystery novel of the same name that the Charybdis' only surviving astronaut, Colonel Stephen G. Ritchie, had on board. This was in an attempt to provide Ritchie with an artificial environment to simulate normal life, a la 2001 A Space Odyssey. Problem is, Ritchie is fully aware of the novel's cliched characters and bad writing. Apparently he only found out after he brought it onto the ship. In order to escape, Riker, Data, and Worf have to gamble at the hotel casino to win enough money to buy the hotel, all while having to interact with the simulacra of mystery novel characters and their awful dialogue. Okay boys, look, we can't afford to have any trouble in here. Why don't you just take this outside? Yeah, I like that. Come on, baggage man. I don't believe this dialogue. Did humans really talk like that? Not in real life. Yeah, see, the thing is, just because you point out how bad the writing of this novel is doesn't mean that it isn't cringy when you still showcase it throughout the episode. That's also bad writing. Ironically, this episode also has a pretty obvious continuity error, albeit one that only arose to my understanding because of the TNG remaster. The updated version of Ritchie's mission patch clearly states that the Charybdis is humanity's first manned attempt to travel beyond the solar system, but the dialogue and original mission patch indicate that it is the third attempt. Which is it? Pick one. Overall, there's a reason that this episode is considered one of the most embarrassing of season two. But you just wait. That's not even the worst one, by a long shot. More on that later. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. In episode 13, Times Squared, the Enterprise encounters a duplicate of Picard from six hours in the future. The episode is a classic exploration of free will versus determinism, and the crew must figure out why Picard would have abandoned ship in a shuttlecraft while the rest of the crew has evidently perished. It's overall a, a pretty decent episode, but like lots of time travel stories, the solution essentially works because it has to for the plot, not because it necessarily makes any intuitive sense. I hate temporal mechanics. So overall, I have to admit, this is kind of a letdown for me. Episode 14, The Icarus Factor, introduces Will Riker's father, Kyle Riker, a civilian advisor for Starfleet. After Will is offered command of the USS Ares, Kyle is sent to brief Will about the mission. But there's a catch. Riker has daddy issues. Riker's father abandoned him when he was 15. The two decide to work out their frustrations with a game of Anbojitsu, prompting a conversation between Troy and Pulaski in which they opine on the nature of male aggression. In spite of human evolution, there are still some traits that are endemic to gender. You think that they're going to knock each other's brains out because they're men? Human males are unique. It's always this battle of the sexes stuff in, in these 80s episodes. Boys will be boys or, or something. Long story short, they work out their differences, at least for the moment. Oh yeah, and, and, and Riker also chooses not to accept command of the ship because, well, being the first officer of the Enterprise is more prestigious than being the captain of not the Enterprise. Episode 15, Pen Pals, is quite underrated in my opinion. In it, Data receives a transmission from a young girl on a pre-warp planet that is experiencing intense volcanic activity. Data communicates back with the girl, a clear, direct, conscious violation of the Prime Directive, Starfleet's non-interference policy. This prompts a very passionate discussion among the senior staff about the merits of Starfleet's number one rule, until they decide that 
just this once, they'll save this one civilization from being annihilated, just as a treat. Uh, okay, I, I, I kid, of course, but this episode does contribute meaningfully, in my view, to the broader conversation about the Prime Directive's importance and whether or not it's a good idea. Maybe a good idea for a video. Suffice it to say, I think it's a matter of shades of gray. That joke will make more sense in a bit. So you like horses for the romance. Episode 16, Q Who, is another one of the most highly regarded episodes of season two and of the series as a whole. In it, Q, in one of his little tests for humanity, introduces Starfleet to the Borg, who of course go on to be one of the major villains in the franchise. This episode makes a direct connection with the season one episode, The Neutral Zone, in which a then unknown force has completely wiped numerous Federation and Romulan outposts off the map. Overall, Q Who is an exciting outing with some great dialogue, especially from Delancey. It's not safe out here. It's wondrous with treasures to satiate desires both subtle and gross. But it's not for the timid. Guinan is also central to the plot of this episode, and we get some great lore about how the homeworld of her people, the Elorians, was ravaged by the Borg centuries ago. Ultimately, Picard realizes that Q has probably done Starfleet a favor by giving them a kick in their complacency, something that I expound upon in my video about the Lost Era. Oh yeah, and this episode also introduces Ensign Sonia Gomez, who, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, disappears after two episodes. She was originally intended as a love interest for Geordi LaForge, but plans for this fell through, so they just <laughs> didn't ask the actress to come back. It's like, Okay, can you, can you give her something else to do, please? But while Gomez does at first come off as incredibly clumsy... Oh no! Oh, I'm sorry! Oh, Captain! She does show up again later on, having gotten her act together, so to speak, and is captain of the USS Archimedes in Lower Decks. Speaking of Lower Decks, episode 17, Samaritan Snare, introduces the Pack Leads, one of the most annoying aliens in Star Trek, if you ask me. They at first appear incredibly stupid and incompetent, but over the course of the episode, it's revealed that in actuality, they are incredibly stupid and incompetent. But they do have a degree of cunning as they are able to trick the Enterprise into sending over Geordi to help them make their ship go, only for them to hold him hostage so that he can reveal secrets about the Enterprise's weapons. Ultimately, though, the Enterprise crew outsmart the Packleds with another ruse, bringing Geordi back home and making the Packleds fear hydrogen exhaust for decades. The B-plot is actually a nice change of pace, in my opinion, as Wesley pilots a shuttle to Starbase 515 so Picard can undergo heart surgery. Wesley and Picard bond, and we get some lore about Picard's cardiac replacement from a fight with a Nausicaan in his youth, something that we see play out on screen in the season six episode, Tapestry. We also get some confusing dialogue about how the Klingons have supposedly joined the Federation, even though no such thing occurred, at least not until the 26th century, according to Enterprise. Though this has retroactively been deemed a reference to the Two Powers Treaty of Alliance. You will never attain the 24th level of awareness. Episode 18, Up the Long Ladder, is honestly one of the most racist episodes of television I have ever seen. Captain, you better get somebody down here. Right away. <laughs> it's what I like to call TNG's other, other racist episode. The first two being, of course, season one's Code of Honor and The Last Outpost. By the way, I know that a lot of people got triggered when I called those episodes racist. Uh, deal with it. Look, it's not a universally held opinion, but it's a commonly held opinion. I'm just reporting 
what other people have said. In Up the Long Ladder, the Enterprise takes on the neo-transcendentalist passengers of a ship bound for a planet in the Ficus sector. These passengers are, let's call it, stereotypically Irish to the point that, again, many consider it to be downright offensive. Oh, that's what I call a wee drop of the creature. The Enterprise discovers a long-lost Earth colony on a planet in a neighboring system that is on the brink of collapse due to a reduced gene pool, as many of the original colonists died, so the survivors turned to cloning. So what better way to solve this crisis than to unite these two peoples? It makes sense, mind you, and this episode was originally intended to be an allegory for the benefits of immigration, but holy hell did they drop the ball on the execution. And what are you staring at? You never seen a woman before? I thought I had. Episode 19, Manhunt, is another Loaxana Troy episode. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. Long story short, Loaxana is going through the Betazoid equivalent of menopause. But in Betazoids, this leads to insatiable sexual desire, which prompts Loaxana to lust after Picard, more so than usual, I should clarify. Picard cleverly plays her, though, and by the end of the episode, she's able to satisfy her needs on the holodeck. See, they, they confirm that people use it for that, you know, <laughs> somebody's got to clean that up. Overall, this episode isn't spectacular, but it is the source of many iconic memes. A Betazoid woman, when she goes through this phase, quadruples her sex drive. Or more. Or more. Never told me that. Episode 20, The Emissary, not to be confused with the DS9 pilot Emissary, introduces Kalar, a half-human, half-Klingon ambassador who happens to be a former love interest of Worf's. Oh boy. She's brought in to help deal with the waking occupants of a Klingon sleeper ship from an era when the Federation and Klingon Empire were at war. Kalar is played brilliantly by Susie Plaxon, who also played Dr. Salar in The Schizoid Man, Female Q in Voyager's The Q and the Grey, and the Andorian Terra in Enterprise's Ceasefire. Kalar's biracial heritage has naturally informed her diplomatic experience and views on the world. She and Troy compare childhoods, both being half-human, and she has frequent clashes with Worf, dismissing Worf's traditionalist attitudes towards honor and marriage. The Worf is a stick in the mud, but he is not representative of all Klingons, not in the slightest. Interestingly, Worf, who is usually the quickest to suggest an attack, emphatically states his belief that the Klingons on the sleeper ship can be integrated into modern society. He's learned a lot over the past couple years on the Enterprise. But Kalar is pessimistic. She believes that the only option is to destroy the vessel. Ultimately, Worf comes up with a rather brilliant plan to avoid having to attack, and Kalar goes over to the Klingon vessel to help acclimate them into the 24th century. How would you like to man? Comfortable chair. In episode 21, Peak Performance, the Enterprise participates in war games. Riker is selected to command 40 officers of his choice aboard the aging USS Hathaway, and a Zakdorn strategist, Serna Kolrami, comes aboard to observe for Starfleet. However, the war games are complicated by the arrival of a Ferengi vessel in the system, wishing to claim salvage on the Hathaway. Before the simulation begins, Kurami defeats Riker in a game of Stratagema, and he gloats about this. Kurami is kind of a dick, even insulting Riker's leadership capabilities on multiple occasions. Kurami's smugness prompts Pulaski to suggest Data challenge Kurami in Stratagema, expecting Data will bust him up. But Data actually loses so he devises a rematch strategy that causes Kolrami to forfeit in frustration. In the strictest sense, I did not win. 
Jada. I busted him up. <laughs> Finally, episode 22, Shades of Grey, is considered one of the worst episodes of all of Star Trek. It's basically a clip show. Yes, they did one of those. This isn't Seinfeld, this is Star Trek. Pulaski must treat Riker for an infection that he contracts on an alien planet, and the only way to get rid of it is to trigger painful memories. <laughs> yes, this is, this is real. And it's also literally the only episode of seasons one or two that I've actually fast forwarded through on rewatch. I, I couldn't sit through the clips and the clip show. I, I did watch some of them on 1.5 speed. Sh should, I, should I reveal that? I don't know, I don't know if I should real, reveal that. There's really not much to say except for that this episode was a casualty of budget overruns on previous episodes. They just, they just had to show the face in space. Man, what a way to end a season. Yes, th that was the season finale. Overall, TNG Season 2 is full of ups and downs. It's very hit or miss. It's got some fantastic entries like Elementary Dear Data, The Measure of a Man, and Q Who, as well as some of the franchise's lowest points like Up the Long Ladder and Shades of Grey. I would be remiss, of course, if I didn't contextualize some of this. The reason that so many of these episodes are recycled scripts from the original series and Phase 2 was because of the 1988 Writers Guild of America strike. That's also the reason that this season only has 22 episodes instead of 26, although personally I'm glad. I've, I've always felt that 26 episodes was too many. Leads to too much fluff, if you ask me. But while while season 2 gets clowned on, as my fellow members of Generation Z often say, it's also regarded by many others as when the show started to get good. In fact, they even call it growing the beard. Personally, I feel like season 2 actually does have more low points than season 1, but it also has more high points. Again, hit or miss. So should you watch it or not? Well. At the risk of trying to sound like I'm exercising more authority than I probably have, I'll give a reasonably condensed viewing order that includes some of the best episodes, in my opinion, but also ones that offer critical context for broader conversations in the franchise. These are Where Silence Has Lease, Elementary Dear Data, A Matter of Honor, The Measure of a Man, Contagion, Pen Pals, Q Who, Samaritan Snare, The Emissary, and Peak Performance. Oh, that's um, that's only 10 episodes. Ah hell, throw in Times Squared for good measure. Okay, 11. That's half the season. Just like with season 1, I recommend skipping half of this season as well. It, it's coming down. So my final question to you today is, do you want to hear me talk about seasons three through seven? Originally, I had only planned on covering seasons one and two as they tend to stand apart from the rest of the show, but a lot of people say that about seasons six and seven. In any event, let me know down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long, and engage.
busted him up. Hey guys, Tyler here. In previous videos, I've analyzed Star Trek The Next Generation seasons one and two, examining their themes as well as their contributions to the broader lore of the franchise. For many fans, TNG's first two seasons stand apart from the rest of the series. Gene Roddenberry had a tighter grip on creative decisions, and a bevy of other factors gave it a more surrealist vibe. But unfortunately, this led to a lot of awkward moments. Though not a universal opinion, a large contingent of the fandom considers season three to be when the show got good. But despite how I may have titled this video, I am not here to review the remaining seasons, per se. Instead, I'd like to do what I set out to do from the beginning, provide some insight into the narrative choices made, and catalog key additions to Star Trek's canon. And maybe I will offer my opinions on some of these episodes. By the way, there will be spoilers in this video. With that, Let's get started. Before we dive into the episodes themselves, I want to offer a little background on Season 3. One of the most evident changes is that Gates McFadden is back as Dr. Beverly Crusher. As I mentioned in my Season 2 video, McFadden claims she was fired from the show for being too vocally critical of decisions made by the studio, Paramount. She was replaced for the season by Dr. Catherine Pulaski, played by Diana Maldor. The writers considered the Leonard McCoy-like Pulaski character to be a failed experiment, and an extensive letter-writing campaign, as well as support from the likes of Patrick Stewart, led to McFadden being rehired. Season 3 also sees some promotions. Geordi LaForge is promoted from Lieutenant to Lieutenant Commander, and Worf is promoted from Lieutenant Junior Grade to Full Lieutenant. The crew receives some new, looser-fitting uniforms with a raised collar and no shoulder striping. At first made of spandex, the uniforms are eventually made of wool to relieve back pain. Props and models like the Type 2 phasers, tricorders, and even the Enterprise D herself are redesigned with more detail. Even the opening title sequence is changed. This time, instead of a grand tour of the solar system, more abstract astronomical phenomena precede the ship's arrival on screen. And another change that I, as an artist and student of filmmaking, appreciate is that Season 3 introduces a new cinematographer, Marvin Rush, who replaces Edward R. Brown and continues to work on Trek for the next 16 years. Rush's visual style, which includes a bright, vibrant color scheme as opposed to Brown's more subdued lighting, heavily alters the look of the series from this point onward. By the way, before we continue, I do want to take a moment to let you guys know that according to my analytics, over three quarters of the people who watch these videos are not subscribed. Come on guys, what are you doing? Hit that subscribe button so you won't miss my future uploads. Now, moving on. Many changes to TNG that I mentioned earlier are first evident, of course, in the season three opener, Evolution, written by Michael Piller, who went on to become head writer of TNG. The episode sees Wesley Crusher accidentally create an intelligent race of self-replicating nanites that threaten the ship's safety. Astrophysicist Dr. Paul Stubbs, accompanying the Enterprise to observe the explosion of a red giant star, wishes to exterminate the nanites as they are interfering with his research. But after Data is able to establish communication with the nanites, they make it clear that they are simply acting out of self-defense and mean no harm. As a result, they are resettled on the planet Cavus Alpha 4, another installment in the decades-long arc as to how Wesley Crusher might actually be God. The episode features an argument between Wesley and his mother about how Wesley is taking on too much responsibility. Look, I have done everything that everyone has asked of me and more. And how can you know? You haven't even been here. 
I don't know, man, this just really strikes me as the kind of interaction that Gene would not have liked in season one. We love character conflict, good writing. The episode also continues another theme that Trek has been exploring practically since its inception, the relationship between organic and artificial life, or at least life forms of different kinds. Stubbs' belief that it's absurd to refrain from eradicating the nanites lest they be intelligent may seem unfederation-like, but it's a natural human reaction that stems from fear of the unknown. This theme is one of many that is also explored in episode 2, The Ensigns of Command in which the Enterprise must relocate human colonists on a planet claimed by the Shiliac. Foreshadowing somewhat the Maquis conflict later on, these humans refuse to leave their homes despite their planet, Tau Cygna V, having been ceded to the Shiliac in the 2255 Treaty of Armands. Except, unlike the Maquis situation, these colonists accidentally crash-landed on Tau Cygna V 22 years after the treaty was ratified. Data is sent down to this Class H planet to convince the colonists to leave, and he's called a walking calculator by the colony's leader, Goshevin, another sign of disrespect. These folks' resistance to evacuation is understandable, but ultimately it is misguided. They are placing themselves in unnecessary danger as they are no match for the Shiliac's weaponry. Picard and Troy try to negotiate with the Shiliac to buy some more time to conduct the evacuation, while Data strives to battle Goshevin in the marketplace of ideas using reverse psychology. Though doomed, your effort will be valiant. And when you die, you will die for land. While some colonists want to leave, these people are in the minority. Colonist Adrian McKenzie helps Data realize that actions speak louder than words, and Data vaporizes the flow of water from the colony's aqueduct. He does this to demonstrate that the Shiliac will do far worse, convincing the colonists to leave. By the way, the Shiliac are a non-humanoid species that I've wanted to talk about for a long time. But that, that may have to wait for another video. Keep your eyes peeled. Speaking of powerful beings, Episode 3, The Survivors, introduces the Dowd, another race of godlike aliens. In the episode, we learn that at least one Dowd, posing as a human male named Kevin Uxbridge, traveled to Earth in the early 2330s and fell in love with a human woman named Rashan. The two got married, eventually moving to Rana 4 after a few decades. When the Enterprise first arrives at Rana 4, however, all that's left is the Uxbridge's house and a plot of land amidst an eerily barren landscape, evoking similar vibes to classic TOS episodes like the Squire of Gothos, and the Savage Curtain. After the crew suspects that Kevin had something to do with the other colonists' disappearance, Kevin reveals the truth. Not only is he endowed, I mean endowed, but he is also a pacifist. He refused to use his powers to fight back against Hushnak invaders. But after Rashan was killed, he retaliated by wiping out all of the Hushnak. And not just the ones invading. I killed them all. All Hushnak. Everywhere. And of course, he was only keeping Rashan alive as a memory. Ultimately, the Enterprise crew allows him to continue to live out this fantasy in private. It's only appropriate that this first contact episode is followed by another one, Who Watches the Watchers, which is also a quintessential Prime Directive episode. When a Federation observation team on Mintaka 3 is plagued by an explosion, a member of the native intelligent species, the Mintakans, is injured by proxy. The Mintakans are a Bronze Age society with proto-Vulcanoid physiology, one of numerous such races throughout the galaxy. The Prime Directive's rigidity is perfectly showcased, in my opinion, when Picard asks Dr. Crusher why she didn't let the Mintakan man, Liko, die to reduce cultural contamination. A very Picard question, I might add. But it doesn't matter since the cultural contamination has already occurred, effectively. Despite attempts to erase his recent memory, 
Liko remembers everything about his visit to the Enterprise's sick bay when he returns to the planet, and his daughter Oji corroborates this. The Mintakans go on to form a religion with Picard as their god, and they threaten to harm another Federation observer to please Picard. Obviously, this has to be stopped. Picard convinces the Mintakans that he and his comrades are mere mortals like them, just with more advanced technology, and someday the Mintakans' civilization might join them among the stars. This strong start to season three is followed by a string of episodes that, with a couple exceptions, are not as highly rated from a critical standpoint until about the mid-mark of the season. But they do offer some key developments in the lore as well as character development. You know, that thing. Episode 5, The Bonding, explores the theme of loss as the crew helps young Jeremy Astor, get it? Aster, deal with the death of his mother on an away mission. The episode ends with Worf, who led the away team, accepting Jeremy into his family with the Klingon Rushtai ritual. In episode 6, Booby Trap, Geordi seeks help from a holographic recreation of Dr. Leah Brahms, one of the designers of the Enterprise's warp engines, to escape a thousand-year-old booby trap in space. Let's just say things get a little bit frisky, and Brahms shows back up later on. Episode 7, The Enemy, introduces, or rather continues, the story arc of political tensions between the Federation and a Romulan Empire that has ended its 53 years of isolation. This arc continues with Episode 10, The Defector, in which a censured Romulan admiral tries to warn the Federation of an oncoming Romulan attack, only to realize that he has been deceived. In The Enemy, Geordi is trapped with a Romulan centurion in a dark cave on Galorndon Kor, and the two must work together to escape. While at first the injured Romulan mocks Geordi for being blind, saying that in his society Geordi would have been terminated, his visor comes in handy to identify a neutrino source acting as a beacon, which will signal the Enterprise to beam Geordi up after he alters its frequency. Meanwhile, on the Enterprise, a second Romulan is in critical condition in sick bay, but refuses a ribosome transfusion from Worf. No skin off Worf's back since he wouldn't donate ribosomes to a Romulan anyway. Worf's decision allows the episode to explore themes of bodily autonomy. The Romulan in sick bay dies, but the Centurion on Galorndon Kor is returned home alive, greeted by Commander Tomalok, who himself goes on to become a recurring character. Episode 8, The Price, introduces the Barzan, who have become relevant on the interstellar stage due to the discovery of a stable wormhole in their system connecting the Alpha and Gamma quadrants. If that sounds a tad familiar, you can probably guess how this episode ends. As it turns out, Unlike with the Bajoran wormhole, the Gamma Quadrant terminus of the Barzan wormhole isn't stable. Shifting between the Gamma and Delta Quadrants and stranding a Ferengi scout vessel in the latter. These Jokers show up again in the Voyager episode, False Prophets. As you can probably guess, bids for access to the Barzan wormhole break down after its instability is revealed. This episode also explores the ethics of using empathic powers, as bitter on behalf of the Chrysalians, Devanani Rall is one quarter Betazoid and uses this to his advantage in negotiations. When Deanna confronts him about this, he basically says, right back at ya, forcing her and the audience to re-examine the ethics of her role in aiding Picard's diplomatic negotiations. As a side note, the Barzan are said to lack manned space travel, though obviously they have a sufficient level of technology to warrant communication with other alien civilizations, a demonstration of how technological progress isn't always linear. Ethics are front and center in at least two other episodes of TNG's third season. The Hunted and the, in my view, severely underrated The High Ground. 
The former deals with issues like the treatment of prisoners as well as veterans as the Enterprise becomes entangled in an extradition dispute over Angosian soldiers who have been chemically enhanced. And The High Ground is an early Trek exploration of terrorism as Dr. Crusher is kidnapped by Ansada terrorists on the planet Rudia IV. Her captor, Finn, is the leader of a rebel faction vying for independence from the planet's eastern continent. Finn justifies many of the rebels' actions by pointing out to Crusher that the ancestral hero of her homeland, one George Washington, was himself considered a terrorist by the British Empire. The difference between generals and terrorists, Doctor, is only the difference between winners and losers. You win, you're called a general. You lose... You are killing innocent people! How much innocent blood has been spilled for the cause of freedom in the history of your Federation, Doctor? How many good and noble societies have bombed civilians in war, have wiped out whole cities? But much like Starfleet turned Maquis leader Michael Eddington, despite legitimate grievances against the oppressing power, Finn is legitimately putting his people in danger. Rather than using conventional transporters, the Ansada use dimensional shifting tech that is slowly damaging their cells. The cellular effects of dimensional shifting are further explored in Season 3 of Discovery, as well as in shows like Fringe, which by the way featured Leonard Nimoy as Dr. William Bell. The way this episode plays out is different from the way that media about terrorism has played out after 9-11, with a closer analog to the Rudian conflict being, perhaps, the struggle of the Irish Republican Army. And indeed, when Data talks to Picard about terrorism, he mentions the Irish reunification of 2024, an event that, while unlikely to actually occur anytime soon, is eerily timely given the politics of the UK post-Brexit. Ultimately, Finn dies for his cause, but the seeds of change on Rudia IV are planted after a child soldier lowers his weapon. The plot of helping resolve a civil conflict is also explored in the episode The Vengeance Factor, in which the Enterprise helps bring two factions of Akamarians to the negotiating table. After helping Q get his powers back after being kicked out of the continuum in Deja Q, Return that moon to its orbit. I have no powers! Q the ordinary! Q the liar! Q the misanthrope! What must I do to convince you people? Die. Oh, very clever, Worf. Eat any good books lately? And solving a murder mystery in A Matter of Perspective. Commander, don't please. She's lying, that never happened. TNG's exploration of wartime tensions continues with the iconic episode, Yesterday's Enterprise. In this episode, the Enterprise C emerges through a temporal rift, creating an alternate timeline in which the Federation is badly losing a war to the Klingons. The Enterprise C was present at the historic battle of Narendra III, in which they attempted to defend a Klingon outpost from attack by the Romulans. But unlike in the correct version of history, in this alternate timeline, the sea is lost before they can help stop the assault on Narendra 3. Tasha Yar returns as the butterfly effect erases her death on Vagra 2, and she still serves as tactical officer in Worf's absence. Guinan's Elorian physiology signals to her that something is seriously wrong. Wesley even has a proper uniform. He's not supposed to get one of those until episode 24, Menage a Troy, when Will, Deanna, and Luaxana are abducted by the Ferengi, and Picard must recite Shakespeare to get Get them back. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? The, the context for that makes it sound less ridiculous, I promise. But back to yesterday's Enterprise, Guinan must convince Picard to send the Enterprise C back through the rift to finish the battle even though they will certainly die, thus preventing the Klingon War and restoring the Two Powers Treaty of Alliance. Yar goes with them, having learned that she's not supposed to still be alive, and helps restore the timeline. Yar's decision will have significant ripple effects, something that we'll explore later on. It's an Earth drink. Prune juice. Warrior's drink. 
The next two episodes deal directly with family. In The Offspring, Data creates, well, an offspring. After copying his own neural pathways into a new android body, Data lets his child choose its gender and appearance. The android selects the image of a human female, and Data gives her the name Lal, which in Hindi means beloved. Lal at first has much trouble with basic motor skills and, of course, social interaction. He's biting that female! But learns very quickly even surpassing Data's programming in some areas. The episode invokes questions about the ethics of letting machines self-replicate in this manner, a question not lost on Starfleet as they send an admiral to order Law's relocation to the Daystrom wing on Galar 4 for further study. There's a legitimate question as to whether or not Law actually would be better off leaving Data as he can only do so much aboard the Starship Enterprise to properly parent her. But ultimately, the prospect of being forced to leave against her will causes Lal to suffer a cascade failure due to intense fear. That's right, she experiences emotion. One, briefly, and a negative one at that, but it does occur. Alas, while Lal's life was not meant to be, her memories do remain with Data. We must strive to be more than we are, Law. It does not matter that we will never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own rewards. Familial loss of another kind is at stake in the next episode, Sins of the Father, which introduces Worf's brother Kern. He is sent to bring Worf to Kronos to challenge their father Mog's discommendation for having aided the Romulans in the attack at Kittimer that orphaned Worf and Kern. The truth is that it was Duras's father, not Mog, who is the traitor, but Worf accepts discommendation to save the Empire after Kern survives an attempted murder by Duras. After being abducted by unnamed aliens studying human behavior in Allegiance, Picard takes a vacation in the episode Captain's Holiday on the pleasure planet Risa. We first learn of terms like Horgon, a totem of Rysian sexuality displayed by those seeking Jamaharon. But Picard's vacation is interrupted by two Vorgons seeking the Tox Utat, a crystal-like device that can halt all nuclear fusion inside a star. Originating from the 27th century, the Tox Utat is allegedly buried somewhere on Risa, and the legend brings archaeologist Vash and her Ferengi competitor Sovak, played by Max Grodenchik, aka Rom, to Risa as well. Picard ultimately thwarts the Vorgon's plan to obtain the Toxutot by destroying it. Picard and Vash's romance is rather unparalleled in any previous installment of TNG, or, well, any subsequent installment for that matter. So it should be no surprise that this is definitely not the last we'll be seeing of her either. Episode 20, Tin Man, is a classic episode dealing with a cosmic Cosmozoan or space-born life form called Gom2. This creature, perhaps the last of its kind, basically intends to commit suicide by hanging out near a star that's about to go supernova. That is, until Betazoid first contact specialist Tam Elbrin, who feels rather misunderstood by society, merges with Gom2 before they depart for, well, parts unknown. Episode 21, Hollow Pursuits, introduces Lieutenant Reginald Barkley, an incredibly neurotic officer who lets his holodeck fantasies, in which he recreates members of the crew, interfere with his duties. But while Barkley's antics annoy the crew, I am the goddess of empathy. Cast off your inhibitions and embrace love. He does help solve a problem that threatens the safety of the ship, earning his crewmates respect, and giving him the confidence to delete his deepfake porn. I am the guy who writes down things to remember to say when there's a party. And then when he finally gets there, he winds up alone in the corner, trying to look comfortable examining a potted plant. 
In episode 22, The Most Toys, Data is abducted by a collector, played by Saul Rubinek of Warehouse 13 fame, who fakes Data's death in a shuttle accident. This episode is actually quite effective at portraying the abuse of a captor against his captive. Why don't you put on these lovely new clothes and go sit on the chair? I must decline. Behave normally. I knew you could hear me. Come along, Varia. <laughs> You're much more fun than Marshall's new toy. <laughs> You'll regret this. I'm going to miss you. Fajo. <sighs> and it also shows how the crew would react to Data's death, capturing its pure senselessness much like Tasha Yar's. Episode 23, Sarek, is the second major recurrence of a character from the original series on The Next Generation. The first, of course, being Dr. Leonard McCoy in Encounter at Farpoint. The episode explores the theme of aging as Sarek is diagnosed with Bendai Syndrome, a rare disease that causes Vulcans to lose control of their emotions. Continuing the themes of life, death, and change in between, episode 25, Transfigurations, serves as another early showcase of ascension in the Star Trek universe as the Enterprise crew witnesses the birth of a new life form, the Zalconian energy being. Oh, and this is also the first episode in which Chief O'Brien comes into sick bay with a dislocated shoulder after kayaking on the holodeck. And finally, episode 26, the best of both worlds brings back the Borg, who have wiped the Federation colony at Jury 4 off the map. This episode introduces Commander Shelby, Starfleet's tactical expert on the Borg, who accompanies the Enterprise as they prepare for a response. Shelby poses a threat to Riker, who continues to be pressured to accept a promotion to become captain and leave the Enterprise, leading to some fantastic dialogue between the two. You disagree with me? Fine. You need to take it to the captain, fine. Through me. You do an end run around me again. I'll snap you back so hard you'll think you're a first year cadet again. May I speak frankly, sir? By all means. You're in my way. How terrible for you. All you know how to do is play it safe. I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man for as long as you have, passing up one command after another. When it comes to this ship and this crew, you're damned right I play it safe. If you can't make the big decisions, Commander, I suggest you make room for someone who can. Indeed, the best of both worlds is remembered to this day for how it threatens to shake up TNG. After Picard is captured and assimilated by the Borg into Locutus, the season three cliffhanger leaves the audience wondering if Picard will come back at all. Mr. Worf, fire. As you can probably tell, I didn't go into as much detail about every single episode in this video. Originally, I shot it as a combo video where I discussed seasons three and four together, but that was gonna be like an hour long, and I just, I just didn't really wanna have to squeeze all that commentary into the runtime of a video that's the same as my Expanse video. Besides, I thought that splitting it up like this was more convenient for you guys, since you told me that you want to hear me talk about each season episode by episode anyway. While my commentary for season three is admittedly more concise, and I want to stress that this series, this recap series, has never been a review series, to the extent that I am reviewing these episodes, I just think that the writing is tighter in TNG Season 3. So I didn't have as much to say critically about each episode. Some one-off episodes still don't contribute much in the way of broader lore, but I didn't really see the point in reciting their plot beat by beat. So would I recommend skipping any episodes in Season 3? Well, 
Honestly, not really. Probably the weakest episode of season three is The Vengeance Factor, but even this is still effective in exploring some of the serious themes that are present throughout all of season three. In any event, hopefully this video did serve as a thorough, thoughtful analysis and follow up to my coverage of seasons one and two. And I hope you're looking forward to my coverage of the remaining seasons, which I would like to get to sometime this century. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and make it so. Hey guys, Tyler here. In previous videos, I've analyzed the lore of Star Trek The Next Generation seasons 1, 2, and 3, in addition to highlighting some of the standout moments, comedic and otherwise, from TNG's first 74 episodes, I've also wanted to examine how each season and even each episode tackles theme, characterization, and other key aspects of quality media. TNG's first two seasons are considered by many to have weaker writing. Franchise creator Gene Roddenberry had a tighter grip on creative decisions with his rules for human behavior in the 24th century, making it difficult to write dramatic television. But in season three, Roddenberry took a step back and arguably TNG's characters and storylines started to flourish. Story threads in season three continue into season four, such as Picard's assimilation by the Borg, Worf's discommendation by the Klingon High Council, and more. Indeed, TNG season four over all tackles the theme of family. In this video, I invite you to join me as I analyze this season's contributions to the broader Star Trek canon. But first, a word from today's sponsor, me. The average YouTube viewer, impressionable, innocent, blissfully unaware that their life could fundamentally change at any moment. But while we don't have all the answers, we are however aware of one thing the cause. Orange River merch. Many have fallen victim to the alluring effects of t-shirts, backpacks, hoodies, even ceramic coffee mugs, all of which can be purchased from the privacy of your own home at the click of a mouse. Now you might be thinking, I can just buy one item from the link in the video description, but let me ask you this, can you be so sure? You begin with Star Trek and then you venture down the path of other sci-fi franchises, Mass Effect, Metroid, and whatever else the future may hold. But while we may never know the full extent of this modern merch mania, we do know one thing. Don't buy Orange River merch, or you might find yourself in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Let's get started. TNG Season 4 picks up immediately with the conclusion of The Best of Both Worlds. 17 minutes in, we witness the aftermath of the Battle of Wolf 359, where a single Borg cube under Locutus's command has single-handedly destroyed 39 Starfleet ships, leaving only one intact. It's the most devastating military defeat in Starfleet history before the onset of the Dominion War. Among the survivors, we later learn, is Benjamin Sisko, who comes face to face with Picard two years later, knowing full well that Picard was Locutus. Picard's actions as Locutus continue to haunt him for, frankly, decades after his shipmates rescue him and he is disconnected 
from the Borg Collective. Jean-Luc's trauma is explored front and center in Season 4, Episode 2, Family, in which Picard visits his brother, sister-in-law, and nephew at the Picard Vineyard in La Barre, France. We also get to meet Worf's adoptive parents, the Rojenkos, and the episode brilliantly juxtaposes these positive family role models with Jean-Luc's jealous brother, Robert. I was always so jealous, and I had a right to be. A right? I was always your brother. Watching you receive the cheers, watching you break every rule our father made and get away with it. Though he does come around a bit. They took everything I was. He used me to kill and to destroy, and I couldn't stop them. I should have been able to stop them. I tried. I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't got it up. So, my brother is a human being after all. This is going to be with you a long time, Jean Luc. A long time. You have to learn to live with it. Indeed, as we're about to see, the theme of family is ever present throughout Season 4. Episode 3, Brothers, sees Data and a reactivated lore rescued from drifting through space by a pack-led vessel. We look for things. Summoned via humming signal to the secret hideout of their creator, Dr. Noonien Soon, who is close to death. We get the first glimpse of the emotion chip, which Data adds to his positronic net in the movie Star Trek Generations. Oh, yes! I hate this! It is revolting! More? Please. Long story short, shenanigans ensue, and Laura escapes with the emotion chip, even though he already has emotions. As you can imagine, this is going to cause some instability, and Laura shows back up in Season 6. Episode 4, Suddenly Human, features an orphaned human boy adopted by Talarians, first name dropped in Season 1 and the boy does not wish to return to human life. While at first it's suspected that the boy has been abused, the crew comes to learn that there is more to the situation than initially meets the eye, and the resolution is rather poignant. And the episode is a rather underrated exploration of how Picard approaches parenting as he fosters the boy during the midst of a diplomatic crisis. You're probably not aware of this, but I've never been particularly comfortable around children. Really? Episode 5, Remember Me, sees another one of Wesley's experiments go wrong and trap Beverly in a pocket universe with increasingly wacky physical rules. Computer, what is the nature of the universe? The universe is a spheroid region 705 meters in diameter. Gates McFadden gets to shine in this outing, which also brings back the Traveler to help Wesley get his mother back. Episode 6, Legacy introduces Tasha Yar's sister Ishara, who gets the Enterprise entangled in a struggle between rival factions on their planet Turkana 4 after a freighter crash lands there. The highlight of the episode is definitely Ishara's chemistry with Data, and the episode's bleak ending underscores how trust can lead to betrayal. Without trust there's no friendship, no closeness, none of the emotional bonds that make us who we are. And yet you put yourself at risk. Every single time. Episode 7, Reunion, is not only a major development in the arc of Klingon politics, but also in Worf's personal life. Ambassador Kalar comes back on board, this time with a child, their son, Alexander, who is conceived in the Season 2 episode, the Emissary, as opposed to her resistance to taking the oath of marriage in The Emissary, this time it's Kalar who wishes to unite their family, but now it's Worf who doesn't want to take the oath, since he fears his discommendation would dishonor Alexander. Meanwhile, the Klingon Chancellor Kimpek asks Picard to become the Arbiter of Succession, as Kimpek has been poisoned, either by Duras or Gowron. Picard helps confirm Duras's guilt after he kills Kalar, leading Worf to kill Duras, paving the way for Gavron to become Chancellor. In Episode 8, Future Imperfect, Riker wakes up what appears to be 16 years 
in the future as captain of the Enterprise, and he must help ratify a peace treaty between the Federation and Romulus. This future ultimately turns out to be an elaborate simulation, which Riker realizes after seeing the face of his deceased wife is none other than that of Minuet, the sentient hologram created by the Binars in the season one episode 11001001. I did that from memory. Perhaps it would be best if we discuss this. Shut up! I beg your pardon. I said shut up! As in close your mouth and stop talking. While at first this simulation appears to be a Romulan operation, in actuality it is meant to entertain an alien orphan left on the planet Alpha Onias III by his mother to protect him from invaders that killed his people. Fun fact, Future Imperfect is actually the first episode to feature nurse Alyssa Ogawa, who also goes on to become a recurring character. Episode 9, Final Mission, is Wesley's last assignment aboard the Enterprise before he departs for Starfleet Academy. And he's going to college. <laughs> Damn it. Steve's going to college. He and Picard are stranded along with an alien shuttle captain on an unforgiving desert moon. The trio's journey to find shelter and water leads to Picard becoming injured, and Wesley must care for him while dealing with the shuttle captain's impatience. The episode drives home Picard's role as Wesley's new father figure, with the two bonding more closely than ever as it seems Picard's final moments might be near. Luckily, the Enterprise crew finds their stranded comrades in this memorable episode's final act. Another fun fact, this episode marks the first mention of Boothby, the groundskeeper at Starfleet Academy, who we get to meet in season five. Episode 10, The Loss, is in my opinion the most severely underrated episode of season four. In it, Counselor Troy temporarily loses her empathic abilities, which in her mind compromises her ability to do her job. Her crewmates try to console her by reminding her that she is, in fact, half human, and we humans have to walk around every day without being able to directly read others' emotions. But Deanna won't have it. She basically loses it at Beverly in a memorable scene. You have no idea. No idea what this is like. How can you know what it's like to lose something you never had? I don't claim to. And yet you're telling me that I'm supposed to get used to it. If our positions were reversed, what would you tell me? If our positions were reversed, I wouldn't have been in here treating skinned elbows while you were lying passed out on your office floor. Seeing one officer yell at another in TNG might not seem like anything worth noting, but on the contrary, just like Wesley and Beverly's argument in Evolution. Look, I have done everything that everyone has asked of me and more. And how can you know? You haven't even been here. It does demonstrate how TNG has matured by this point to focusing on more character drama and interpersonal conflict. Deanna's empathic abilities are restored, ultimately, as the Enterprise escapes being pulled into a cosmic string by two-dimensional beings. Oh yeah, by the way, this episode, a another rather tasteful exploration of disability, seems to, along with yesterday's Enterprise, confirm string theory as the grand unification theory in the Star Trek universe. Yeah, this is, um, this is definitely uh, written in the 90s. I don't really care for string theory, if you can't tell. I think it's just kind of silly. Fucking, I wish I could invent 29 dimensions to make sense of the universe. Episode 11, Data's Day, features the wedding of Keiko and Miles O'Brien, DS9's... <laughs> one of DS9's power couples. We are told that Data actually introduced Keiko and Miles and that Keiko and Data have been longtime friends. Something that we don't, to my recollection, ever really actually see the origins of, but they are friends nonetheless. This episode's structure with narration by Data throughout sets it apart from previous installments and also introduces a number of iconic elements of TNG, including the ship's bully and barber, Data's cat Spot, and the unforgettable scene where Beverly teaches Data to dance 
and the meme that scene produced. Episode 12, The Wounded, introduces the Cardassians, who of course go on to become major antagonists in Deep Space Nine. This episode establishes that an armistice between the Federation and Cardassian Union has ended their decades-long border skirmish, and also introduces the backstory of O'Brien's deadly encounter on Setlick 3, in which he was forced to kill a Cardassian soldier. Mark Alimo, who plays Gold Dukat in DS9 and played a Romulan in The Neutral Zone, plays Gol Maset in The Wounded. As the Enterprise must stop the rogue Captain Maxwell, O'Brien's former CO, from restarting the Cardassian War, questions abound as to the Cardassians' true commitment to peace with the episode ending on an ominous line from Picard. Take this message to your leader's Galma set. We'll be watching. The next three episodes, Devil's Do, Clues, and First Contact, are essentially more episodic entries in Season 4. In Devil's Do, Data presides over a trial to determine the fate of a planet tangled up in a scheme by a con artist posing as that society's devil. In Clues, the Enterprise crew must figure out why Data is lying to them about events that occurred while they were unconscious for 24 hours. As we find out, Data is ultimately acting in the best interest of the crew, as Picard ordered Data to keep secret their first contact with the xenophobic Paxons, who seek to erase the crew's short-term memories. And First Contact, one of my favorites, of season four sees Riker hospitalized on the pre-warp planet Malkor III after a botched surveillance operation preceding potential first contact with the Federation. The episode is also another quintessential Prime Directive episode as Picard struggles with how to handle the cultural contamination that has occurred. It also features my favorite guest actor to point out, Carolyn Seymour, who plays the Malkorian scientist Mirasta Yale. Following this is episode 16, Galaxy's Child, a de facto sequel to Booby Trap. This episode is probably one of the most controversial in TNG, as Geordi's behavior throughout the episode has come under intense scrutiny, especially over the past few years. After learning that Dr. Leah Brahms is coming aboard to study engine modifications that Geordi has made, Geordi takes the opportunity to try and initiate a romantic relationship with Brahms. Recall that the Enterprise computer had programmed that holographic recreation of Leah to aid Geordi during the ship's time of crisis. Well, the affection that that hologram showed towards Geordi is juxtaposed with the real Leah, dismissive of how Geordi has fouled up her engines, demonstrative of the real-world give-and-take between designers and field engineers. This is played for laughs, and Leah's failure to live up to Geordi's expectations is lightly mocked by Guinan. Computer glitch? Must have been. Maybe it was your old visor. What are you talking about? Well, the one you wore when you were on the holodeck with her. That is the same visor. Really? Well, I figured it was probably the one that lets you see what you want to see. Now, she's probably done the most horrific thing one person can do to another. Not live up to your expectations. But Geordi is persistent, even inviting Leah to a private dinner in his quarters. Yeah, the, the phrase, coming on too strong, tends to come to mind, perhaps even the word unprofessional. His bubble is ultimately burst after Leah reveals that she is, in fact, married. Which, by the way, occurs in the first scene inside a Jeffrey's tube as another spaceborne life form attached to the Enterprise's hull drains energy from the ship, Leah calls up Geordi's hollow program, originally designed as a simulation of the drafting room at Utopia Planitia. Would there be any other files with data on the original engine specifications? I believe so, Doctor. This file utilizes the prototype engine schematic. I'll run it on Holodeck 3. She went where? Holodeck 3, sir. I didn't think there was anything wrong with her seeing the file. No, of course not. Nothing at all! 
and finds her hollow double in the state that Jordy last left her, talking sexy. I'm with you every day, Jordy. Every time you look at this engine, you're looking at me. Every time you touch it, it's me. Jordy walks in on Leah, who is, well, you know, understandably outraged, feeling violated. How dare you use me like this? How far did it go, anyway? Was it good for you? Leading Jordy to defend himself and swear that this isn't what it looks like. But after solving this episode's shipwide crisis, Jordy does apologize to Leah once and for all, and the two seem to hit off a platonic friendship. Nevertheless, several fans still consider Jordy's behavior in this episode to be, I mean, somewhat predatory. Their language, not mine. Though I think the crux of the issue is that the you know, the computer programmed this thing in the first place. Could Jordy have told the computer to make the hologram more professional? Sure, but he didn't really have a lot of time to be concerned about that. Should he have probably deleted it? Yes. And I do think there's something to be said about how other people can invade somebody's privacy in the holodeck, including walking in on Barclay's fantasy program in Hollow Pursuits. These episodes have become more relevant in the 2020s with the advent of things like deepfake porn, but I think it's really, really important to make a distinction between 21st century deepfake porn and, oh God, this video is going to get demonetized, and 24th century holograms. They are not the same thing. While Jordy's reaction to Leah's discovery could have been much better. I'm guilty of a terrible crime, doctor. I offered you friendship. At the end of the day, I think it comes down to whether or not you think there's an issue with him kissing a holographic recreation of a real person in a, a moment that was supposed to be private and was supposed to stay private. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Regardless, Galaxy's Child isn't really that strong of an episode anyway, but I wouldn't recommend skipping it because it does offer some important development for Jordy and Leah's characters. And that context matters because in at least one possible future, they do get married. In episode 17, Night Terrors, the Enterprise is trapped adrift in a remote area of space, with the crew finding themselves unable to dream. The only ones unaffected are Data and Troy, though Troy does experience nightmares. We're treated to multiple scenes of Deanna flying through a misty environment towards the binary suns of the star system that they're in. These shots get shit on pretty frequently, uh, but they're, you know, they're, they're competently executed from a VFX standpoint. I mean, you know, good compositing, color correction, all that stuff. Anyway, it turns out that the nightmares contain a coded message that helps the crew escape. Night Terrors is followed up by the much stronger entry, Identity Crisis, in which the crew must save Geordi from being mutated into a member of a reclusive alien species. This is followed by another iconic Barkley episode, The Nth Degree, in which an energy discharge from an alien probe causes Barkley to become the smartest human who ever lived. This is in an effort to guide the Enterprise to the center of the galaxy to make first contact with the Cytherians who gain knowledge by bringing other species to them rather than the other way around. Barkley is returned to normal by the end of the episode, but he does continue to gain his crewmates' respect, showing real growth as a person in an episode that allows Dwight Schultz to absolutely shine. Episode 20, Cupid, features the return of Vash as a Federation Archaeology Symposium is held on the Enterprise. This, however, is interrupted by Q, who whisks Vash and the Enterprise crew away to his recreation of Sherwood Forest. I protest! I am not a merry man! Forcing Picard as Robin Hood to rescue Vash in a grand demonstration of his romantic feelings towards her. This episode ends with Q offering to take Vash on the adventure of a lifetime to see parts of the galaxy that no human has ever seen, an offer which Vash can't refuse. And one we notably see the outcome of two years later with the DS9 episode, Q-less. You hit me. Picard never hit me. I'm not Picard. 
episode 21, The Drumhead, is another one of the most highly regarded of the series. In it, retired Starfleet Admiral Norris Sadie convenes a drumhead trial, basically a witch hunt, against an Enterprise crewman named Simon Tarsus, who is accused of aiding a Klingon spy for the Romulan Empire. Tarsus is himself one quarter Romulan, a fact that he lied about on his application to enlist in Starfleet, but one that Picard won't let ruin his career. In episode 22, Half a Life, while Loaxana Troy is aboard the ship, she falls in love with a Kalon scientist named Timison, who is conducting experiments to save the Kalon sun from dying. But Timison is not long for this world. Not because he's particularly ill, but because on his home planet, once people reach the age of 60, they are put to death in a ceremony known as the Resolution. This custom understandably horrifies Loaxana, but Picard reminds her that it is not her place to interfere with Kalon culture. This relationship between Laxana and Timison is very well written, in my opinion, making it all the more heartbreaking when Timison goes home to die at the end of the episode, though Laxana will be by his side. Episode 23, The Host, introduces the Trill. I've talked extensively about this episode on this channel before, particularly about how its depiction of the Trill differs substantially from their depiction in DS9 and beyond. After Federation Ambassador Odon is brought in to mediate a dispute between the moons of Peliar Zell, a shuttlecraft accident puts the life of his symbiont in jeopardy. The symbiont is temporarily placed inside Commander Riker until a new Trill host can arrive, and Odon continues a romantic relationship with Beverly that she had had with Odon's previous host. The nature of Trill biology is different in this episode as the symbiont seems to more fully take over the host body as opposed to the blended personality seen with the likes of Jadzia and Ezri Dax. The episode ends when Odon's new host, a Trill woman named Kareel, is joined with the symbiont. But Beverly cannot bring herself to continue the relationship. She chalks this up to a personal failing of humans, being unable to keep up with all the rapid changes. Beverly's dismissal of the possibility of dating Kareel has been criticized by some as being homophobic, but I don't really think this is very fair. I mean, you know, some people are just heterosexual. The episode also, in a way, contradicts the later established taboo against romantic reassociation between Trills and the partners of past hosts. It's also said that Odon cannot use the transporter, which some fans have speculated is a lie to cover up the existence of the symbionts. Episode 24, The Mind's Eye, continues the Romulan espionage arc. As Geordi is abducted and brainwashed to kill the Klingon governor of Krios Prime on the eve of their possible independence, which would start a war between the Klingons and the Federation. The crew ultimately prevents this assassination, and the episode ends with Counselor Troy telling Geordi it will take him a long time to recover from this violation of his mind. Additionally, the Creosians, while not seen on screen, do go on to appear in the season 5 episode the perfect mate. Interestingly enough, possessing similar makeup to the redesigned Trills in DS9, though their spots don't go all the way down. All the way. In episode 25, in theory, Data pursues a romantic relationship with a lieutenant named Jenna, and fails spectacularly. But not all at once. Data is incredibly kind towards Jenna after she has just broken up with her boyfriend, and he makes strident attempts to be romantic. But in classic Data fashion, he over-emulates what he perceives as the most effective strategies for romance instead of just being himself, which makes Jenna realize the whole thing was a mistake. While tragic in a sense, of course, the episode is pretty entertaining and is a pretty compelling demonstration of the dangers of being somebody's rebound. You have often expressed dissatisfaction with the Spartan nature of my quarters. Is this an attempt at embellishment? The cat's out of the bag. <laughs> Spot? 
And finally, episode 26, Redemption, continues the Klingon story arc as the Empire is on the brink of civil war. Picard and Worf travel to Kronos to attend Garon's installation, but he has a challenger, Toral, son of Duras, who has the support of most of the High Council. Worf recruits Kern and four squadron commanders to defend Gowron against the House of Duras's forces, beginning the Klingon Civil War. After driving Duras's forces away, for now, Gowron's ceremony is completed, and he restores Worf and Kern's family name. But the fight has only begun, and Worf, forced to choose between his Starfleet career and loyalty to the Empire, resigns his Starfleet commission to serve aboard Garon's flagship, the Bortus. The episode also confirms that House Duras is still secretly colluding with the Romulans and introduces the character Sela, daughter of Tashiar's counterpart from the alternate timeline in Yesterday's Enterprise, and a Romulan general. First teased in the mind's eye, Sela plays a major role in Redemption Part 2, the season 5 premiere, something that I think is best saved for the next installment of this recap series. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and make it so. I am not a merry man! <sighs> yeah, man, I, I don't know what else to say. Like, my audience wanted me to cover all of the seasons of TNG on my channel, and like, that makes sense, but I knew going in that a numbered series on YouTube was going to have increasingly smaller view counts with each installment. I mean, this is the reason that Let's Plays died years ago. What the hell? Get the f*** out of here, man. Get the f***. Hey guys, Tyler here. So, Star Trek The Next Generation, it's one of the greatest shows of all time, am I right? The sequel series to one of the most influential sci-fi programs of the 20th century. I've made four videos analyzing the lore of each season of TNG cataloging key additions to Star Trek's canon, as well as examining themes, characterization, and other story elements. I have, as well, offered my opinions on the quality of each episode. But apparently, YouTube doesn't like that I've been making a four-part, now five-part series and isn't promoting these videos to as many new people. Look, I know that you guys have been enjoying the episode-by-episode -episode format, but it's killing me in the algorithm. I just want to eat. But I couldn't just not finish the series, and I know that a lot of you also missed the longer retrospectives. While I have less to say about certain episodes in these last few seasons, I thought I'd combine my concise commentary with the deep dive format that a lot of you guys have been pining for. You could say that I'm offering the best of both worlds. So, in this video, I'd like to take an overall look at TNG seasons 5, 6, and 7, examining just how the show changed in its final three seasons. Let's get started.
Season 5 opens with the conclusion of the two-part episode, Redemption, which chronicles the Klingon Civil War. Remember that Chancellor Gowron faces a threat from House Duras, while Duras himself has been killed by Worf, revenge for framing Worf's father for the attack on Kittimer 20 years prior. Gowron still faces a challenge from Duras's son, Toral. That's where we pick up in part two. Prejudice and the struggle to overcome it is one of the prevailing themes of this outing, one of the most obvious examples involving Data. Data is placed in command of the USS Sutherland, part of a blockade to stop the flow of supplies from the Romulans to Duras's fleet. But the Sutherland's senior officer, Hobson, has trouble taking orders from an android. Excuse me, sir. I'd like to request a transfer. May I ask why? I don't believe I'd be a good first officer for you. Your service record to date suggests you would perform that function adequately. No, 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 that's not what I mean. I don't think I'd be a good first officer for you. Why? Frankly, sir, I don't believe in your ability to command this ship. I understand your concerns. Request denied. Redemption Part 2 also fleshes out the life story of Sela, who is teased in the Season 4 episode, The Mind's Eye, and first makes an appearance at the end of Redemption Part 1. We should not discount Jean-Luc Picard yet. He is human. And humans have a way of showing up when you least expect them. We learn, of course, that she is the daughter of a Romulan general and Tasha Yar from the alternate timeline of yesterday's Enterprise. Picard has trouble believing her story, viewing Sela merely as a distraction. Doubts? I'm full of them. Long story short, Gowron orders a full assault on Duras's ships so that they'll be forced to call for supplies, exposing the Romulan involvement once and for all. After Data foils Seal's last-ditch efforts, Duras's forces are left to surrender, ending the Klingon Civil War. Worf is given the opportunity to kill Toral, but Worf, seeing but a child at the end of his blade, refuses and forbids his brother Kern from killing Toral either. Continuing the motif of tensions arising from differences in culture, are the next two episodes, Darmok and Ensign Row. The first one is a brilliant exploration of diplomacy and communication between peoples with seemingly insurmountable differences. Darmok introduces the Tamarians, whose language is based on metaphors derived from their history and mythology. Darmok Angelad at Tanagra. Darmok Angelad on the ocean. Ensign Rowe introduces the Bajorans and Cardassian occupation of Bajor that has been going on for some 40 years. We're also introduced to the character Roe Laren, played by Michelle Forbes. Roe has a very casual disregard for respect and procedure, in many ways the polar opposite of what is expected of an officer serving aboard the Enterprise. I don't want to be here any more than you want me to be here, sir. Then why did you take this assignment? If I may be equally candid, it's better than prison. Better than prison? There are officers who wait years to serve on this ship. Being called back into Starfleet was not my idea. Nor ours. After rooting out the real culprit behind an attack on a Federation colony, Roe earns her place on board the ship as a trusted and valuable officer. The episode indicts the Federation as bystanders to the genocide of the Bajoran people a biting criticism of the Prime Directive. We come to learn that Bajoran civilization is half a million years old, and the Bajoran people are willing to do anything to overthrow the Cardassians. This theme of prejudice is just as present in Episode 4, Silicon Avatar, in which a xenologist named Dr. Kila Mar comes aboard the Enterprise to study the aftermath of an attack by the Crystalline Entity. Dr. Mar lost her son in the attack on Omicron Theta, the colony where Data and his brother Lore were built. She falsely believes Data has the same motivations as Lore, who lured the creature to Omicron Theta, but she soon relents. 
She becomes enamored with the fact that Data's creator, Dr. Soong, programmed the colonists' experiences into Data's positronic brain, asking Data to play some of her son's logs so she can hear his voice again. And the sci-fi conflict of the episode derives from the crew's struggles over whether to make contact with the crystalline entity, hoping to dissuade it from killing more humans, or destroy it when they get the chance. Dr. Mar. Dr. Mar, we must return to the intermittent signal. The entity is beginning to resonate. Vibrations are increasing. Dr. Mar, stop the transmission. That is an order. It's for you, Rennie. I did it for you. Mr. Data, shut down the transmission. I cannot stop the graviton signal, Captain. Dr. Mar has isolated the access code. You say you did it for him. But I do not believe he would have wanted that. Yes. I believe your son would be very sad now. More significant long-term consequences for the crew, however, emerge in Episode 5, Disaster. A quantum filament disables the Enterprise, separating the crew into various parts of the ship to face perils alone. Picard is trapped in a turbo lift with a group of kids. Troy is left in command on the bridge, accompanied by O'Brien and Roe. Crusher and Geordi are stuck in one of the cargo bays and must depressurize it in order to put out a plasma fire. Riker and Data attempt to make their way to main engineering under the assumption that all of the bridge crew are dead. You must now change the input matrix of my secondary optical port and then connect the ODN conduit. That is not the correct port, sir. And Worf, who is really funny in this episode, helps Keiko O'Brien deliver her baby in 10 forward. Have you ever done this before? Yes. Oh. No. I took the Starfleet Emergency Medical Course. In a computerized simulation, I assisted in delivery of a human baby. Sometimes it doesn't go by the book, Worf. Congratulations. You are fully dilated to 10 centimeters. You may now give birth. That's what I've been doing. Bearing down is the next stage. It should start at full dilation. Why has it not begun? I don't know. I don't think it's up to me. It happens when it happens. Oh. Computer simulation was not like this. Uh. Did you feel an uncontrollable urge to push? Uh. Good. You are bearing down. Uh. Push, Keiko. Uh. Push. Uh. Push. Uh. Push. I am pushing! This episode, in my opinion, balances very well the juxtaposing tones of humor and drama with all of the tension of a disaster movie. But it's also very important for two characters in particular, Picard and Troy. Picard because this experience helps him somewhat overcome his uncomfortableness around children, and Troy because this episode puts her on track to take the bridge officer's examination later in the series. Oh, and of course, it features the birth of Molly O'Brien. These first five strong entries are followed by one that is widely regarded as weaker, however the game. After Riker brings back an addictive augmented reality game from Ryza and gets the crew hooked, it's up to a visiting cadet Wesley Crusher and Ensign Robin Leffler, played by Ashley Judd, to save the ship. The 1980s drug PSA vibes are strong with this one. Whatever this thing does, it must feel pretty good. Even though the episode aired in 1991. But it's not a completely useless episode. For one thing, Judd delivers a performance that's more fun to watch than lots of Wesley's previous flings. Not the least of which because Leffler is a more grounded, three-dimensional character. Your neutrinos are drifting. For what? We're also introduced to Robin's Laws, a collection of 102 adages she's written down whenever she learns something essential. Ultimately, we find out that the game is really a plot by the Katarians to destroy the Federation from the inside. But this plan is foiled by Wesley, Leffler, and Data, the latter of whom is immune to the game's effects. I will say this episode gets shit on a lot, and for good reason, but it's just so damn funny. And by the way, this isn't the last we'll see of the Katarians. The character Naomi Wildman in Voyager is a half Katarian, half human hybrid, although her Katarian makeup design is far different from TNG's. Katarian, Katarian, cuff shut the f up. TNG's exploration of diplomacy resumes with one of the most memorable two-parters in Star Trek history. 
Unification, which is dedicated to Gene Roddenberry, who unfortunately passed away shortly before this episode aired. Unification follows Picard and Data as they are tasked with finding out why Ambassador Spock has seemingly defected. As it turns out, he hasn't defected. He's been consorting with the Romulan underground movement. He has also been in talks with Pardek, a Romulan senator and advocate of Vulcan Romulan reunification, which both see as a potential solution to the conflict that has separated the two cousin species for millennia. Picard expresses his disappointment with Spock's cowboy diplomacy, the sort of under-the-table negotiation, without first consulting the Federation Council. We ultimately find out that Pardek is in cahoots with Sela who has orchestrated the theft of three Vulcan ships as part of a Romulan peace envoy, really a Trojan horse designed to launch an attack on Vulcan. Several actors get to shine in this outing. Brent Spiner in particular gets to show off his comedic range. I'm sure the Klingons found it amusing to put us in here together. Since I do not require sleep, I propose you take the shelf. I rather enjoy writing. I don't get to do it very often in this job. Perhaps you would be happier in another job. And the scenes Data shares with Spock are some of the best character-focused moments of the episode. The two discuss their different approaches to humanity. While Spock has chosen to suppress his emotions through Kolinar, Data instead strives to become more human. We also get to see Sarek, who is in the final throes of Bendai Syndrome, one last time before the character passes away. Peace and long life. After the invasion plot is foiled, Pardek loses his credibility with the Romulan underground, but the seeds of hope are planted that one day Vulcan and Romulus can reconcile, something we see come to fruition as per Star Trek Discovery's Unification 3. Unification is bookended by another whimsical one-off installment, A Matter of Time, in which the Enterprise is visited by a time traveler, Berlinghoff Rasmussen. Rasmussen introduces himself as a historian from the 26th century who has traveled back in time to observe the Enterprise crew's handling of a crisis at Penthara 4. At one point, Picard is torn on whether to implement a highly risky solution and asks Rasmussen what choice to make, but Rasmussen cannot reveal this. Picard concedes there may be some sort of temporal prime directive preventing Rasmussen from interfering, but as it turns out, Rasmussen is actually from the 22nd century in New Jersey at that. Having stolen his time ship and taken it on a joyride, Rasmussen is apprehended, but we later learn in Star Trek Voyager that the Federation does employ a temporal prime directive by the 29th century in order to preserve the integrity of the timeline. The first half of this season is rounded out by a relatively weaker bunch of episodes, starting with New Ground, in which Worf's adoptive mother, Helena Rojenko, brings Worf's son Alexander aboard the Enterprise, and insists Worf take care of the boy. Worf's parents, his mother explains, are getting older and are having trouble keeping up with Alexander. Worf agrees to take his son in, only to find that Alexander continues to have behavioral problems, such as lying and stealing. Worf seeks advice from Troy on how to address these problems, planting the very earliest seeds of the romantic relationship between Worf and Troy in Season 7. New Ground is by no means terrible, but it does suffer in that the sci-fi B-plot, wherein the Enterprise helps test a new type of propulsion called the Soliton Wave, is incredibly uninteresting. Alexander has acted shamefully, and as his father I must now deal with him. But I find that I would rather fight ten Balduck warriors than face one small child. After this is Hero Worship, essentially a rehash of the Season 3 episode of The Bonding, as Data helps a young boy, the sole survivor of a wrecked research vessel, cope with the loss of his parents. This time, however, the boy emulates Data's emotionless android personality to suppress guilt over his belief that he caused the accident, but in truth, it was a gravitational phenomenon that claimed the ship, something that almost destroys the Enterprise as well. And then there's the appropriately titled Violations, 
which features the Yulians, one of whom telepathically sexually assaults Troy while trying to frame his father for the act. And of course, this is something that's never brought up again. While all of these episodes have their weaknesses, the next one, the Masterpiece Society, in my opinion, takes the cake. In it, the Enterprise visits a colony of genetically perfect humans and attempts to save the colony from a rogue stellar core fragment. Deanna falls in love with the colony's leader, Aaron Connor, in one of the, and I'm not sorry about this, most boring, if not the most boring, romances in Star Trek history. It's not enough that the acting in this episode is some of the flattest in season 5, but the colony's purpose, to create a paradise populated by people without flaws, whatever that means, is just such an icky concept to me. It's thinly veiled eugenics, everyone born with a role in society predetermined, just authoritarian nonsense. Regardless, one highlight of the episode is Geordi's interactions with the colonists. He figures out that the same tech that powers his visor can be used to send a high energy pulse through the ship's tractor system and move the stellar core fragment. He remarks about the irony of a prosthetic made for a blind man saving a society where he would have been terminated as a fertilized embryo. Of course, this this sort of exploration of Geordi's disability and his visor saving the day is much better handled in Season 3's The Enemy. TNG's exciting plot lines pick back up with Conundrum, one of my favorites of the season. This outing sees an alien vessel emit an energy beam that causes all of the personnel on board the Enterprise to lose their long-term memories, specifically biographical information, as is common in retrograde amnesia. They do, however, retain their skills in operating the ship, but what they they also don't realize is that there's someone on the bridge who wasn't there before, wearing a Starfleet uniform, and who also claims memory loss. But how did this happen? What did this to us? We're all trying to find the guy who did this! The senior staff is eventually able to access their personnel files to relearn their identities, and we learn the name of this mystery officer, Macduff. The ship is drawn to the command center of the Lycians, with whom the Federation is supposedly at war. But the crew senses that something's not right about this war, and they grow even more suspicious of Macduff. They eventually figure out what's going on, and Dr. Crusher is able to restore the crew's long-term memories. One of the highlights of this episode is Michelle Forbes' performance. We get to see a more comedic side of Ensign Rowe as, with her guard down and without the previous knowledge of her contentious relationship with Riker, the two engage in a brief romance. What if I snore in my sleep? What makes you think you're gonna get any sleep? Conundrum exists back to back with another fun sci-fi romp, Power Play, in which an away team consisting of Troy, O'Brien, and Data are possessed by the disembodied souls of prisoners on a moon of Mabu 6. At first, the three claim to be the senior staff of the 22nd Century Federation starship Essex, but Picard is skeptical as the three take hostages, hoping to intimidate Picard into letting them escape the planet. Picard believes this is something a Starfleet crew would never do, although Worf points out that they very well could have gone mad. Ultimately, the prisoner's true identity is revealed, and their plan to free hundreds of other prisoners is thwarted. While Power Play doesn't really tackle any major themes or moral or political issues in the same way that lots of other episodes in TNG do, it still does function well as an action piece. Ethical considerations are, however, front and center in episode 16, um, ethics, in which Worf is paralyzed from the waist down after an accident that has shattered his spinal cord. Worf asks Riker to help him commit suicide, to which Riker soundly objects, sparking discussion around cultural relativism and the ethics of suicide. A visiting neurological specialist named Dr. Toby Russell performs an experimental surgery to restore Worf's mobility despite objections from Dr. Crusher, who prefers a more proven therapy that would restore 60 to 70% of Worf's mobility. Worf ends up choosing the experimental procedure, which luckily works, but Crusher still admonishes Russell for rushing her research and not taking the proper time to weigh risks. All right, this one is definitely not gonna piss anybody off. Any controversy elicited by ethics is dwarfed, however, by the subsequent 
The Outcast, not just because the latter explores themes of sexual orientation, but because of how it explores those themes. In this installment, Riker falls in love with Soren, a member of an androgynous alien species called the Janai. The Janai used to have two sexes, but they have since evolved and view gender as primitive. Soren, like some other Janai, strays away from the norm and secretly identifies as female, a fact that, if made public, would prompt the authorities to force her to undergo electroshock conversion therapy. While the writing staff did receive some angry letters from social conservatives, they actually got more letters from gay viewers who felt that the episode's exploration of sexuality didn't go far enough. This is, admittedly, a major problem with allegory in sci-fi, the catch-all connection between the Janai, homosexuality, and transgender identities is so vague that the episode uses a lot of words to say not so much. That said, despite the relative weakness of its political themes, I do think that The Outcast succeeds in other areas. It has some really funny moments. We prefer to stay warm by sleeping with a friend. Commander. Tell me about your sexual organs. And the episode subverts expectations by having Riker fail in his mission. Soren is caught, and she undergoes conversion therapy to erase her feminine identity. Twos, sixes, and aces are wild. That is a woman's game. Cause and effect marks the return of pure sci-fi in season 5. The Enterprise is caught in a time loop in the Typhon Expanse, and the loop keeps repeating after a Miranda-class vessel accidentally rams into the Enterprise's warp nacelle. The crew eventually experiences enough collective deja vu to realize something is up, and they make preparations to change the outcome of the next loop. After crisis is averted, the Enterprise hails the other vessel, the USS Bozeman, commanded by Captain Fraser Crane, uh, I mean Morgan Bateson. While the Enterprise crew has been stuck in the loop for two and a half weeks, the Bozeman has been stuck for 90 years. They've got a lot of catching up to do. This fantastically directed entry precedes a string of more character-focused installments, starting with The First Duty in which Wesley Crusher participates in a cover-up of the death of one of his friends. Wesley and the other members of the Starfleet Academy flight team Nova Squadron had been practicing near Saturn when a catastrophic collision killed cadet Joshua Albert. Nova Squadron's leader, Nicholas Locarno, played by Robert Duncan McNeil, blames Albert for getting scared, though it's clear to everyone that something's not adding up. The episode functions brilliantly as a courtroom drama, and is probably the best Wesley Crusher episode, really humanizing him in a way he hadn't been before. It's also the first time we're introduced to Boothby, the groundskeeper at Starfleet Academy. Probably the weakest entry in Season 5 is Cost of Living, which is another Loaxana Troy-focused episode. This time she's on the Enterprise preparing for her wedding to a man who, get this, she's never met before. She meddles in Worf and Alexander's relationship, undermining Deanna's counseling work and getting Alexander in trouble. This episode is pretty forgettable, all things considered, though it does have its moments, like Loaxana showing up to her wedding naked in hopes of getting her fiancé to call off the wedding. This is infamous! Infamous! We must leave immediately! The subsequent installment, The Perfect Mate, introduces the Creosian species. The Enterprise is tasked with transporting a gift from the leader of Creos to the leader of Vault Minor, whose worlds have been at war for centuries. This gift turns out to be a female empath born and trained to meet the desires of any man. While Picard is incensed by the Creosian's participation in uh, humanoid trafficking, Picard finds himself tempted by the empath. Kamala, played by Famke Janssen. Fun fact, Famke Janssen goes on to play Jean Grey opposite Patrick Stewart's Professor Charles Xavier in the original X-Men movies. The Perfect Mate also confirms that there are dolphins aboard the Enterprise, which later media has tied in with a reference to Cetacean Ops in a previous episode. Oh, what's next? Imaginary Friend? 
I take back what I said about cost of living. This is probably the episode of season five that's the weakest for me and least interesting upon rewatch. As the Enterprise explores an uncharted nebula, Ensign Sutter's daughter Clara's imaginary friend Isabella becomes terrifyingly real. Brought to life by an alien intelligence, curious about the energy output of the Enterprise's graviton field generators. But Isabella seeks to destroy the Enterprise crew for the way they treat Clara. You see, these aliens, energy-based life forms, lack a concept of parenting, but come to an understanding, allowing the ship to pass through the nebula. While this episode does have its defenders, and the performance of the child actors is commendable at least, the premise is one that just doesn't really work as well for TNG, in my view. Better so for something like The Twilight Zone. Regardless, Imaginary Friend precedes another one of the most seminal installments in the franchise, I Borg. In it, the Enterprise finds an injured Borg drone under the wreckage of a crashed ship, and the crew brings the drone aboard to give him medical attention. The drone begins to show signs of individuality, and Geordi gives him the name Hugh. The episode not only functions well on a sci-fi level, but also excels as both a character drama and in terms of ethical considerations. You alright? You felt sorry for me. Look what it got you. I, Borg, is also the first episode to introduce Borg designations, specifically Hugh's designation, Third of Five, which serves as the template for Seven of Nine's designation in Star Trek Voyager. In episode 24, The Next Phase, Following a transporter accident, LaForge and Ensign Rowe are presumed dead. However, they are very much still alive, just out of phase with the rest of their environment. No one can see them, and the two must get to the bottom of what has happened and figure out a way to return to normal. Another pure sci-fi story, this episode is beloved by fans and is one of my personal favorites. It's also followed up by an even more acclaimed entry, The Inner Light. After encountering a strange probe, Picard is struck by a beam of energy and wakes up as Cayman, a resident evil village. Uh, wait. A resident in a village on the planet Catan. As Crusher and Ogawa try to revive Picard on the bridge, Picard lives as Cayman through Catan's final decades. But after Picard wakes up on the bridge, it's only been 20 minutes in the real world. This episode is highly praised for its performances, as well as its intense emotional impact, and it even won a Hugo Award and was nominated for an Emmy. But while the episode should be one of the most consequential in the franchise for Picard, Ronald D. Moore has spoken about how TNG's episodic structure prevented the writers from effectively exploring just how much this ancestor simulation would have transformed Picard's life. That said, the inner light isn't totally inconsequential. Not at all. Future installments feature nods to it in the form of the Resican Flute, an artifact that reminds Picard of his time on Catan. And much like Disaster, this episode is instrumental in changing Picard's attitude towards children, as he has two of them during his time on Catan. While the inner light is certainly emotional, one of my biggest issues with it is, um, Picard didn't consent to any of this. He was effectively forced to leave his life behind for 30 years and be held captive on this dying planet. And then all of a sudden, boom, surprise, it was a simulation the whole time. Forget about your wife, kids, and community. They all died over a thousand years ago. Oh, what the hell? Whoa, whoa, where am I? 55 what the hell? years. Not bad, Morty. You, you kind of wasted your 30s, though, with that whole bird watching phase. Where, where's my wife? Morty, you were just playing a game. Look at this. You beat cancer and then you went back to work at the carpet store? Truly, this is a violation of the same caliber as Jean-Luc's assimilation by the Borg, arguably more so given the time differential. And by far and away, it does not receive a requisite amount of attention in future installments. And lest you think today's woke culture is influencing my opinion on this, just know that I have felt this way ever since I first saw the episode back in like 2012. By the way, the concept of a Starfleet officer experiencing decades worth of simulated memories is explored again with Miles O'Brien in the episode Hard Time. 
Finally, Time's Arrow Part 1. The Enterprise has been recalled back to Earth to investigate the mysterious discovery of Data's disembodied head in a cavern underneath San Francisco. The head is dated to the late 19th century, implying that it is Data's destiny to die on Earth in that time period. This leads the Enterprise crew on a trail of clues that leads them to Davidia 2, home of interdimensional shapeshifters who live just out of phase with normal space-time, and seem to be harvesting human neural energy from the 19th century on Earth. After Data uses a phase discriminator in his positronic net to investigate the away team's surroundings, he finds himself in 19th century San Francisco, where he seeks the aid of Guinan in order to get back home. But their conversation is overheard by none other than Mark Twain, aka Samuel Clemens. Back in the 24th century, Guinan tells Picard he must join the away team, or they might never meet. Picard reluctantly does so, and the away team adapts the method they used for Data to shift their phase. Sound, sounds like a drug trip. They then travel through another temporal distortion in hopes of retrieving Data from the 19th century. TNG Season 5, like every season before it, has its ups and downs. While it does contain some of the most impactful character writing in the show and features more pure sci-fi stories, the emphasis on political, moral, and social issues present earlier in the season does tend to fade a bit as the season goes on. A few of this season's episodes do earn TNG the reputation of being a soap opera set in space, a designation that will linger with it, unfortunately, for the remainder of the series run. But season five also introduces some of the most memorable why do I write alliteration in my vi <laughs> scripts? <laughs> but, do you ever just edit your script while you're reading it? God knows I do that. Yeah, it sometimes. Like, huh, this sentence can't be said. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but season five also introduces some of the most memorable elements of the show, like Ro Laren's character, Sela's backstory, and top-notch episodes like Darmok. I do think that season five is, however, the first since season three that contains episodes I'd consider completely skippable, those being Hero Worship, Violations, The Masterpiece Society, Cost of Living, and Imaginary Friend. You could also throw in the game, but frankly it's too damn funny to pass up if you aren't pressed for time. And while I have issues with New Ground, it is a key development in Worf and Alexander Rojenko's arcs. But interestingly enough, while Season 5 was a lot weaker than I remembered on rewatch, Season 6 was a lot stronger than I remembered. Like a lot stronger. Okay, so this is, okay, we're about one third of the way through. <laughs> Oh my f***ing god, this is going to be an hour and a half long video. Season 6 opens with Time's Arrow Part 2, which wraps up a lot of the mysteries introduced in the Season 5 finale and has a greater focus on Samuel Clemens. For better or worse. Yeah, I unfortunately on rewatch, Time's Arrow just doesn't really hold up as much for me. Well, whoa. The conclusion of this two-parter is followed up by Realm of Fear, in which Lieutenant Barkley's fear of transporting is put on display when he is attacked by a creature inside the transporter beam. Oh, no, my eyes! My eyes! Ah! This episode features lots of key dialogue about transporter safety. You realize if the imaging scanners are off, even one thousandth of a percent. That's why each pad has four redundant scanners. If any one scanner fails, the other three take over. And, in my opinion, puts to rest the ridiculous notion that the transporter is some kind of death machine, as Barkley retains continuity of consciousness in the matter stream. Following this somewhat underrated installment is episode 3, Man of the People, which in my opinion is one of the most unwatchable episodes of the entire franchise. I think I even skipped it on my previous rewatch, which means until recently I hadn't seen this episode in probably over 10 years. After an ambassador is brought aboard to mediate peace talks to end a civil war, Deanna becomes attracted to him and starts to act erratically. Long story short, he's draining the life energy from his victims, which Crusher is able to reverse through some techno babble. I'm telling you, man, there's just, there's just way too many episodes where the writers have Deanna fall for some sketchy f 
back or get violated in some way? What have they got against her? Thankfully, we can put the memory of this episode behind us with the next one, Relics, in which Riker and Geordi revive Montgomery Scott from being stuck unconscious in a transport buffer for approximately 75 years. Scott was working with the crew of the Janolan to investigate a Dyson Sphere, the first of its kind to be featured in Star Trek. Scott tries to make himself useful to the Enterprise crew again, but finds that his expertise is about 75 years out of date, making him feel even more out of place and nostalgic for the 23rd century. No bloody A, B, C, or D. But he and Geordi salvage some of the Janolan systems to help the Enterprise escape from the Dyson Sphere when it's pulled in. After all, Geordi says, a lot of the Janolan's tech operates on the same basic principles as the Enterprise's newer systems. While it's fun to see Scotty and the premise of this episode is pretty interesting, I kind of think the sci-fi storyline in Relics is just okay, but the character stuff is fantastic. What is it? It is. It is. It is green. Relics precedes another one of my favorites the sci fi horror entry Schisms, in which members of the crew are abducted in their sleep and experimented upon by selenogen based life forms native to a subspace dimension. Most of the episode is dedicated to the buildup to this reveal, and the mystery of what exactly is happening to the crew, exemplified by the holodeck scene, is quite exhilarating. It's a shame, though, that the subspace aliens haven't been brought back, though they are fleshed out more in beta canon. Oh, and Schisms also introduces Data's iconic poem, Ode to Spot. Felis Catus. Is your taxonomic nomenclature an endothermic quadruped, carnivorous by nature? It often serves to illustrate the state of your emotion. Commander, you have anticipated my denouement. However, the sentiment is appreciated. I will continue. The next entry, True Q, introduces Amanda Rogers, the daughter of 2Q who took human form. She is assigned to the Enterprise for an internship, hoping to attend Starfleet Academy, but a visiting Q wishes to help Amanda hone her powers, putting her in the difficult position of deciding between corporeal and non-corporeal existence. I always look forward to this episode on rewatch as I think it's a brilliant character exploration with some pretty standout performances. Well, if it isn't number two. Many of these strengths are also present in the underrated Rascals, in which a transporter accident regresses Picard, Ensign Rowe, Guinan, and Keiko O'Brien physiologically to the age of 12, though they retain their adult memories. After a group of Ferengi hijack the Enterprise, something that happens way too often, the four, along with Alexander Rojenko, hatch a plan to retake the ship. So, son, how are you? Are you winning, son? No, Dad, I'm not winning. I don't even play games anymore. They're not fun. I just sit and scroll Twitter mindlessly for hours. It's the same every night. I'm tired, Dad. I understand, son. When I was your age, I felt the same way. We tell you about how harder things were in my days, but really we know it's the same. We just want to believe that our kids are living in a better world rather than accepting that we forged a worse one. For that, I'm sorry, son, and I understand that we have our vices. What is Twitter to you was the park to us. We were no better, but you can be, son. You can be, and I love you. Thanks, number one. He's my number one dad. They're eventually returned to their correct ages using some more transporter science. My favorite part of this episode is the interaction between Guinan and Ro, who each have different perspectives on childhood. There must have been some part of childhood that you didn't loathe. But oh man, talk about poor Miles. 
Throughout TNG and DS9, he's given the memories of a 20-year prison sentence, on another occasion dies and is replaced by a counterpart of himself from an alternate timeline, and in this episode, his wife is reverted to the body of a 12-year-old girl. Talk about hard times. Season 6 offers a recreational breather with A Fistful of Datas, a holodeck western adventure. In this outing, a computer malfunction traps Worf, Alexander, and Troy in the simulation and gives the holodeck characters the appearance and enhanced abilities of Data. A welcome one-off installment, I still have to take issue with this episode coining the phrase ancient west to describe the old American frontier. Ancient history refers to the period between 3000 BC and 500 AD, so even if we're being generous in Star Trek terms, ancient would be like the time of the Vikings, not the friggin' 1800s. Anyway, moral and ethical quandaries return with the quality of life, which introduces the Exocomps, an artificial life form created by a scientist from Tyrus 7 to be used as maintenance tools. But Data believes the Exocomps to be sentient, and sets out to prove his hypothesis. The episode is prescient in a number of ways, including forecasting the rise of literal machine learning. There is also a recurring exocomp character in Lower Decks named Peanut Hamper. I joined Starfleet to piss off my dad. Why? Cells, 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 interlinked, 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 within cells, interlinked, within cells, interlinked. Why didn't you say that three times? After the quality of life, we are delivered one of the most highly regarded and divisive two parters of TNG. Chain of Command. Picard, Worf, and Crusher are tasked with a secret mission in Cardassian territory to investigate a possible metagenic weapon, basically a biological weapon. Instead of Riker becoming acting captain in accordance with the Chain of Command, aren't you glad I dragged you away for a whole day just for that sh <laughs> the Enterprise is placed under the command of Captain Edward Jellicoe, who negotiated the Federation Cardassian Treaty. Admiral Necheyev believes Jellicoe is uniquely qualified to get the Enterprise more battle ready and spearhead further negotiations with the Cardassians, as they're eyeing the border system of Minos Corva. Towards the end of Part 1, Picard is captured by the Cardassians and is interrogated and tortured in Part 2 resulting in brilliant performances from Patrick Stewart and David Warner. We learn about the relationship of Cardassian families with the state, and get some lore on the military takeover of Cardassia, which I expound upon in my video about Cardassian history. Link in the description. Look at it! But besides this brilliant, gut-wrenching torture plotline, the biggest contention of Chain of Command, in my experience, is Jellicoe's behavior, not just towards the crew, but towards everyone. I've always been of the mind that he had unreasonable expectations, although I do credit him with finally putting Deanna in a proper standard uniform. She's a damn bridge officer, she should have always been in one. She was in one in the pilot, for God's sakes. What happened? While some have ragged on Will for being stubborn, I actually think that Jellicoe's command style was not conducive to a productive work environment. But admittedly, there's a lot of nuance to the situation. I even reached out to a handful of other Star Trek YouTubers to get their thoughts and opinions on Jellico. I received a lot of thoughts and opinions, too much for the runtime of this retrospective, but I'm releasing a standalone video about Jellico and Chain of Command a week after this video comes out, so keep your eyes peeled. And the full discussion is also included in the two-hour extended cut of this retrospective, available now to members and patrons at the $5 level and above. Following this gritty two-parter is Ship in a Bottle, which brings back Moriarty, who as we find out has been intermittently conscious for the past four years as his program has been stored in protected memory. Moriarty strongly wishes to leave the holodeck, even begging Picard to allow his companion, Countess Regina Bartholomew, to join Moriarty in the real world. Moriarty traps Picard, Data, and Barclay in the holodeck, 
that the Starfleet officers figure out what's going on and reprogram the simulation to get one over on Moriarty. This is a great mystery episode with some brilliant performances, and the concept of holograms being able to roam free is revisited in Voyager. But who knows? Our reality may be very much like theirs, and all this might just be an elaborate simulation. Speaking of mystery and Aquiel, Geordi falls in love with a woman accused of murder on an isolated communication relay station. A pretty cut and dry crime investigation episode, Aquiel introduces the Hellean species in the form of Lieutenant Junior Grade Aquiel Unari. While this episode is widely regarded as being the weakest of season six, the mystery in and of itself, as well as various subplots, are rather intriguing. But the chemistry between LeVar Burton and actress Renee Jones just isn't there. Regardless, another compelling mystery is delivered in Face of the Enemy, in which Troy is kidnapped and surgically altered to pass as a member of the Romulan Tal Shiar. She's tasked with helping the Romulan underground movement smuggle three political leaders to Federation space. Face of the Enemy once again brings back Carolyn Seymour, who played another Romulan in Contagion and Malkorian scientist Marasta Yale in First Contact to play Commander Toreth. Carolyn Seymour and Marina Sirtis are f***ing excellent in this episode, probably the best Romulan story on TNG. The stakes are even higher in Tapestry, truly one of the most iconic installments of Star Trek. After being attacked on an away mission, Picard finds himself in the afterlife, only to come face to face with Q. No. I am not dead, because I refuse to believe that the afterlife is run by you. The universe is not so badly designed. Q offers Picard the chance of a lifetime to change a crucial moment in his life, the night he was stabbed in the heart by a Nausicaan, a story Picard told Wesley Crusher in the season two episode, Samaritan Snare. Was this before the Klingons joined the Federation? No. The episode also introduces the billiards-like bar game, Domjot. Tapestry is widely regarded as one of the best TNG episodes, and it's definitely one of my favorites. I'm always a sucker for time travel stories. It has been criticized, however, for basically being the plot of It's a Wonderful Life, and the episode does leave some open-ended questions, but you could say that's part of its strength. It's a beautiful story. It gets you right here, doesn't it? Tapestry's character-driven drama is succeeded by the two-part episode, Birthright, the first part of which features two seemingly disconnected storylines that are nevertheless related by theme. In the B-plot, Data discovers that he has the ability to dream, part of a program that Noonien Soong wrote to activate once Data reaches a certain level of emotional development. The main plot, however, involves Worf searching for his father Moog after he is told Moog is alive in a Romulan prison camp. As it turns out, this is not true, but Worf does find that a number of the Kittimer colonists were imprisoned by the Romulans, and Worf tries to teach the children in the camp about Klingon culture. But his provocations are seen by many as disruptive, since the camp has developed into a peaceful community over the past 20 years. While watching both parts of Birthright back to back, I couldn't help but think that they should have been cut down into one episode, or the A and B plots separated entirely, even though, again, they are connected by theme, since we don't get a proper follow-up with Data in Part 2. And you could argue that Julian Bashir's cameo in Part 1 was rather pointless. But maybe I'm wrong. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. In any event, Birthright is an important episode as it does introduce Data's dream program, and it's a fantastic character study for Worf, his racist attitudes towards the Romulans compelling him to do something good, which is to liberate the children of this prison camp so they can return to the homeworld. Oh my god. Escaping imprisonment is the M.O. of Picard in the next entry, Starship Mine, when he is trapped on the Enterprise as it undergoes an energy sweep that is lethal to humans. He's tasked with thwarting a terrorist plot by the technicians to steal trilithium resin from the ship's warp core. The episode is really well directed and is probably one of the most violent of TNG 
which I frankly welcome as a dark one-off departure. This episode also features Tim Russ as one of the technicians prior to his regular role as Tuvok on Voyager. Freeze! I'm thirsty. I said freeze! I'm just getting a drink. All right, had your drink. Now I want I you know. to. I know. Freeze. Jean-Luc is also the focus of the next entry, Lessons, in which he falls in love with the new head of stellar cartography, Nella Darren. However, Picard is put in a difficult position when he's forced to assign her to a dangerous mission. This outing is a beautiful character-focused story with fantastic performances, and it's the closest thing we get to a follow-up to the inner light, as Picard shares with Darren the story of his Resican flute. Why are you telling me this? Because I want you to understand what my music means to me. And what it means for me to be able to share it with someone. Speaking of ancient artifacts, episode 20, The Chase, is an even deeper exploration of Picard's fascination with archaeology, even featuring his mentor, Professor Galen, who comes to the Enterprise with a mystery to be solved. This puzzle ends up attracting the attention of the Klingons, Romulans, and Cardassians, and the final piece uncovers the truth about the origins of humanoid life in the galaxy. While this episode is generally well received, there is a legitimate question as to how necessary it is to explain in-universe the abundance of bipedal aliens in Star Trek's Milky Way. Obviously, the real-world reason is budgetary limitations, but in-universe, the existence of ancient humanoid progenitors who seeded the galaxy with their DNA does bear resemblance to the real concept of panspermia. Either way, the progenitor who appears at the end of the episode is played by Salome Jens, who went on to play the female changeling in Deep Space Nine. And her speech, as well as the episode itself, have been called very Roddenberry-esque by the production staff. The Chase precedes a couple other one-off stories that are nevertheless compelling in their own right. In episode 21, Frame of Mind, Riker fears that he is going insane when he keeps swapping places between the Enterprise, where he is rehearsing a play, and an alien hospital. The episode is really dark and intense, one of the most demanding episodes that Jonathan Frakes has had to carry, in his words, and is definitely one of the most memorable of season six. You gave a truly realistic interpretation of multi infarct dementia. Thank you. Following this is Suspicions, in which Dr. Crusher risks her career and her life to prove that a Ferengi scientist's experimental shield was sabotaged by another scientist who hopes to capitalize on the technology. This tech, the Metaphysic Shield, allows a vessel to enter a star's corona and becomes important later on. Subsequently, Rightful Air continues the loose Klingon political arc by introducing a clone of Kalos the Unforgettable, whom Worf sees in a vision on the monastery planet Barath. This Kalos clone was created by the Borath clerics to challenge Garon's position as chancellor, but an friggin' Christian nationalist looking at. But in order to avoid another civil war, Worf suggests the Empire bring back the position of Emperor as a ceremonial role to act as a moral guide for the Klingon people. Rightful Heir tackles religious themes with a vigor that, frankly, no previous episode of TNG does and features some great performances. Riker is the main focus again in Second Chances when the crew finds a transporter double of him on a planet he helped evacuate eight years prior. And it just so happens that this Riker is still intensely in love with Troy. Like Tapestry, Second Chances is a brilliant exploration of how the choices we make can put us on completely different life paths, even though this Riker didn't choose to be left behind. And pitting the two Rikers against each other over our will's choice not to accept his own command is brilliant as well. Ultimately, Riker's double adopts the name Thomas, their middle name, and accepts a transfer to the USS Gandhi before showing back up again 
as a Maquis sympathizer in Deep Space Nine. Second Chance's intense character study is followed by Timescape, another fun pure sci-fi story that evokes similar vibes to the next phase. Picard, Data, Troy, and Geordi must stop a warp core breach on the Enterprise as the ship engages in a power transfer to a Romulan warbird experiencing engine failure. As it turns out, a race of extra-dimensional life forms has been using the warbird's artificial quantum singularity, which powers the the ship's faster-than-light engine to incubate their young, only to realize it's unstable. This episode is the second to be directed by Leonard Nimoy's son Adam, following Rascals, and also marks the first appearance of a runabout in TNG, a larger version of the traditional shuttlecraft and a vehicle more often seen in DS9. So far, it probably seems clear that season six is one of the strongest seasons, if not the strongest season, of TNG competing, in my opinion, with season four. It's got the best mix, many argue, of political thriller, character drama, moral quandaries, and pure sci-fi storytelling. And I'd largely concur with all of this. But I also remember season six for a less fond reason, that it's the beginning of the end for Star Trek The Next Generation. After delivering a knockout season with brilliant direction, great performances, for the most part, and episodes that frequently make must-watch lists for the series, season six of TNG is also the last great season of Star Trek until, arguably, season four of Deep Space Nine. And to presage this drop in quality is the, in my opinion, appropriately titled season six finale, part one of Descent. In Descent, the Enterprise crew once again encounters the Borg, but this time they're acting as individuals. And furthermore, as it turns out, they're acting under the direction of Data's brother Lore, who is allied with these drones to destroy the Federation. Data experiences his first true emotion, anger, when fighting one of the Borg drones and attempts to recreate this emotion, even to the point of risking his own life in the process. As I have said, many consider Descent to be the beginning of the end for TNG, but also the beginning of the end for the Borg, as they've now been reduced to cultists worshipping at the altar of lore rather than the more menacing, inhuman threat they represented when the Borg were first introduced. That said, Descent is not without its value. Picard is faced with the consequences of letting Hugh go at the end of I, Borg, once again eliciting the question of whether the moral choice is always the right one. Part two serves as the end of Lore's arc as Data is forced to deactivate him, removing the emotion chip and presaging Data's emotional journey in the TNG movies. Part two also features Crusher in command, and the Enterprise scenes have more of a focus on junior officers, highlighting how they act under pressure in one of the ship's crisis situations. And oh, would you look at that, the metaphasic shield comes back. Honestly, I agree with most of the criticisms of Descent. None of it really meshes together in the same way that a lot of other thematically heavy episodes do. Especially the synthetic supremacy thing. It's starting to get really tired and boring. And then, and then they take it up to 11 in Star Trek Picard. I mean, Mass Effect 1. <laughs> and I think elements of other franchises like Mass Effect's Geth Heretics deal with religious indoctrination better than Descent. But alas, this is just a preview of what's to come. All right, six more pages. <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Season seven continues in earnest with liaisons, in which Picard, Worf, and Troy deal with visiting Iaran dignitaries who study foreign concepts in very extreme ways. Dignitaries assigned to Worf and Troy, respectively, explore the concepts of antagonism and pleasure. Another dignitary, Voval, accompanies Picard en route to the Iaran homeworld, but crashes their shuttle on a desolate planet. He then poses, initially unbeknownst to Picard, as a human woman named Anna, who has been stranded there for seven years. As I said, the Ayarans study human concepts with extreme, singular focus. You are an insulting, pompous fool. And if you were not an ambassador, I would disembowel you right here. Do not let my title inhibit you. 
Klingon. Yes. Good. And Voval, as Anna, is no exception. Going so far as to, frankly, sexually assault Picard. I get what this episode is going for, but to say that it was effectively executed from a dramatic storytelling standpoint would be kind of stretching it. But if you thought that was bad, the subsequent episode, Interface, is when a lot of the production staff consider the show to have truly died. Not because the episode itself is like extremely awful or anything, but because it's rather boring and proves that the writing staff was running out of ideas. In this outing, Geordi uses a remote interface to explore the wreckage of a ship inside a gas giant, but he's distracted by an alien posing as his mother, whose ship mysteriously disappeared 10 days earlier when traveling near the same gas giant. Notably, LeVar Burton welcomed this late insight into his character's backstory, although he noted that he wished more had been done throughout the run of the series. And as producer Naren Shankar noted, the idea of a remote interface face like the one in the show is arguably not very futuristic. Even one tied directly to the human brain is something we're likely to develop this century, not 400 years into the future. Nevertheless, Interface gives way to the more interesting two-parter, Gambit, in which Riker is captured by pirates pillaging Romulan archaeological sites and Picard has also infiltrated their ranks. The pirates eventually mutiny against their captain, and Picard comes to find out that a Vulcan isolationist named T'Pol, posing as a Romulan, seeks a powerful weapon that channels negative thoughts into destructive energy. Gambit marks the first mention of the Debrune, a Romulan offshoot species that inhabited local space roughly two millennia ago, and provides some more background regarding the Time of Awakening, the period in Vulcan history that sparked the Romulan exodus from the planet. If Captain Picard were here... He's not. I realize that, sir. But if he were, and he wanted to lead an away team, you would tell him that the captain's place is on the bridge. Not this time. No way. Not this time. Not this time. No. Not this time. Not this time. No way. We got you. Not a chance. Not this time. Not this time. Wrong. Not this time. Not this time. You're wrong. The surrealism is turned up to 11 in Phantasms, a compelling horror episode that has always stood out in my mind. I remember years ago watching this episode for the first time and later remembering nothing but the mouth. That's right, the mouth. <laughs> an illusion perceived by Data as he experiences a waking nightmare brought on by interphasic organisms that have infested the Enterprise's warp core. What kind of cake are you eating? It is a cellular peptide cake with mint frosting. Please, don't hurt me, Data. I am sorry, Counselor. No. Don't! No! No! Dana! I wonder, what would Dr. Freud say about the symbolism of devouring oneself? And you must talk to him. Tell him he is a pretty cat. And a good cat. I will feed him. Mental manipulation shows up yet again in Dark Page, which marks Loaxana Troy's final appearance on TNG, as she helps establish relations with a telepathic race called the Cairn. While Loaxana's trademark overbearingness is yet again on display, this episode is actually pretty poignant as we learn about what is perhaps Loaxana's biggest regret, the death of her eldest daughter, Kestra, who as a child drowned in a lake near the Troy home on Beta Z. Deanna assures her mother that she must forgive herself for Kestra's death as it was a tragic accident. It's this moment that puts into perspective Loaxana's entire character. The guilt she has felt all these years about losing one daughter has informed the overprotective aspect of her relationship with Deanna. You could say it was a dark page in her life.
Thanks, Dark Page. Now I feel like an asshole for calling Luaxana an annoying character in all those other episodes. Although, to be fair, I don't think that this tragic event really excuses how overbearing Luaxana is towards Deanna and being obsessed with like her finding a man and all that stuff. Just like leave her alone, Jesus. <laughs> how can I explain? Tell me telepathically. I hope this gets more than 20,000 views. I hope it gets more than 30,000 views. We're working too hard again, aren't we? Yes, we are. Also, by the way, I think it's rather sweet how Deanna and Will's daughter in Star Trek Picard is also named Kestra. Even more character development is delivered in Attached, as Picard and Crusher, after escaping imprisonment on an alien world, find that their thoughts are linked by a brain implant. Dance the, it's the Neuralink again, Sh Jean-Luc finally admits his romantic feelings for Beverly, although it will be a while before she reciprocates. Fun fact, the planet featured in the episode, Kesprit, is a rare example of a world seeking Federation membership that is not politically united, sparking conversations about the merits of global government, both among fans and in the episode itself. This is followed by Force of Nature, TNG's rather on-the-nose allegory about climate change. After two Hikaran scientists present their findings that warp drive damages the fabric of subspace, warp speed limits are placed on all Federation starships except for emergencies. This episode was written more than six years after the signing of the Montreal Protocol to restore the ozone layer. Force of Nature is pretty boring and it doesn't help that the B-plot is entirely dedicated to something as mundane as Data Training Spot, who by the way is referred to from this episode forward as being female, while previously being referred to as male. Transporter accident? Or could it be that Spot is actually one of several orange cats on the Enterprise who have all wandered into Data's quarters? We may never know. But alas, this isn't the last episode that brings up more questions about Data's past, as the next entry, Inheritance, features Juliana Tainer, Data's mother of sorts, the wife of Dr. Soong, who was present when Data was created. Juliana was instrumental in giving Data his creativity, and we learn that there were other prototype androids Soong built before Lore, one of whom, before, we meet in Star Trek Nemesis. As it turns out though, this Juliana is also an android. The real Juliana died years ago. Her memories transferred to this new synthetic body via synaptic transfer, another process explored in detail in Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery. And by the way, it should go without saying that this whole, uh, she was an android the whole time trope, just, I, I've never been a big fan of it. I mean, you know, yeah, they, they explain that she puts out a false bio reading or whatever, but like still, it's just like, come on. Kind of stretching that suspension of disbelief a bit. Inheritance is succeeded by one of the most highly rated installments of the series, but one that comes dangerously close to jumping the shark. Parallels. Worf finds himself shifting through various parallel realities brought on by the eruption of a nearby quantum fissure. The episode works well for the most part on a dramatic level, with many of the changes being rather creative, such as Data having blue eyes in one reality and the Enterprise having a Cardassian pilot in another. The episode explains the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and introduces concepts like quantum signatures, the idea that each universe resonates on a quantum level with its own unique signature. It's worth noting, in my opinion, and probably my opinion alone, that the show Fringe not only features a similar scene where a character explains branching timelines, something we've all become familiar with thanks to Hollywood's oversaturation with multiverse stories, <clears throat> in game, but also makes significant use of this quantum signature concept, describing in detail how different parallel universes resonate at different frequencies. The moment parallels almost loses me, though, is when Lieutenant Wesley Crusher, a native of one of the quantum realities, hands the crew yet another Deus Ex Machina when he offers a technobabble solution to Worf's reality shifting. But more egregious, to many, 
is that this episode jumpstarts the arc in Season 7 featuring Worf and Deanna's romance, sparked by his discovery that in multiple other realities they are already married and have children. Following these events, Riker's former CO, Eric Pressman, comes aboard in The Pegasus to lead the Enterprise in a salvage operation, stirring up uncomfortable feelings about actions Riker took 12 years ago under Pressman's command. Long story short, the Pegasus was conducting experiments with a new type of cloaking device, a phase cloak that allows a ship to not only conceal itself, but also pass through solid matter. The only problem is, this type of tech is illegal under the Treaty of Algeron, negotiated in good faith, in good faith, in good faith, with the Romulans 60 years prior following the Tomed incident. The Pegasus is a pretty compelling mystery episode, although the memory of it has been kind of tarnished for some by the Enterprise finale, These Are the Voyages, which supposedly takes place concurrent with this episode. Yeah, who signed off on that again? The subsequent entry, Homeward, is also one of the final straws for me regarding the Prime Directive. After Worf's adoptive brother Nikolai violates the Prime Directive by saving a group of villagers from their doomed planet, he spends the whole time being chastised by Picard and being painted as the villain when he's the one trying to save lives. Much like with Interface, I have to agree that this episode serves as yet another example of Season 7's decline in quality from the previous seasons, as yet again we're dragging out the relatives to mine them for character development. Another fun fact, the actress who plays Nikolai's wife, Penny Johnson Gerald, goes on to play Cassidy Yates in Deep Space Nine and Dr. Claire Finn in The Orville. Oh boy, here we go. Sub Rosa, the queen of bad Star Trek episodes. Or is it? That's right. I'm revisiting this old argument. I talked about this episode in my 2021 Halloween video. Don't you mean my 2021 Halloween video? <sighs> my bad ghost, Tyler. In Sub Rosa, after attending her grandmother's funeral on Caldos 2, Beverly is visited by the mysterious entity known as Ronin, an anaphasic life form that inhabits a candle that her grandmother has kept lit for many years. Do not light that candle? And then go to that house. As it turns out, Ronan has been preying on the women in Beverly's family line for generations, and she finally puts a stop to this predation after coming to her senses. Thanks, Ghost Tyler. This episode is often listed as the worst of TNG, but damn it, to be honest, I just I think there are way worse episodes in this series. I really do. The main thing that sets Sub Rosa apart from other Star Trek episodes is that it's just so damn goofy, both in premise and execution. But on rewatch, I can't really fault them for this. I think that Sub Rosa is f***ing hilarious. Nana. Nana's dead. Leave her alone! I mean, how can you not feel that way? Picard catches Beverly masturbating, for God's sakes. And, and by the way, this episode was directed by Jonathan Frakes. Do you believe in the power of a curse? How much money would it take to make you spend a night in a cemetery? And the fact that they were able to get away with as much as they did with this episode on network television in the 90s is frankly commendable. He knew exactly how I liked to be touched. The sensations were very real and extremely arousing. So I am glad that Sub Rosa exists. It is a genuine, rare example of a so-bad-it's-good piece of media. TNG's increasing focus on junior officers peaks with Lower Decks, which depicts a mission of the Enterprise through the eyes of a group of junior officers. As these officers speculate about the nature of a covert rendezvous near the Cardassian border, Picard selects Bajoran Ensign Sito Jaxa, whom we first saw in Season 5's The First Duty, to accompany a Cardassian informant for the Federation back into Cardassian space. She is supposed to return to the Enterprise in an escape pod, but unfortunately, as the crew finds out, the escape pod is destroyed, presumably with her in it. This episode is definitely one of the strongest of Season 7 and naturally served as the primary inspiration for Star Trek Lower Decks, 
being series creator Mike McMahon's favorite episode of Star Trek. Following this is Thine Own Self, in which Data loses his memory while being stranded on a pre-warp planet. The B-plot sees Deanna finally complete her bridge officer's test to become a commander, overcoming significant hurdles and serving as the payoff to the setup from Season 5's Disaster. The tension of the A-plot, in which the townsfolk become sick with radiation poisoning, derives from Data forgetting what radioactivity is, which is arguably a stretch even in an amnesia situation. Radioactive? What does that mean? do not know. Perhaps it is my name. But there's enough to like about this episode that I think it overall functions pretty well. I believe you are reasoning by analogy. Wood, for example, does not contain fire simply because it is combustible, nor does it contain rock simply because it is heavy. The subsequent installment delivers yet another data-focused story, Masks, in which the cultural archive of a long-extinct civilization, the Diarse, begins to take over his body, leading him to exhibit multiple personality disorder. While Brent Spiner yet again gets to show his range, my biggest issue with Masks is that it's terribly boring, mainly because of the multiple rewrites this script went through. By the way, buckle up, because that's going to be a common theme throughout the rest of this video. The absolute dearth of interesting episodes in the remainder of Season 7. The next outing, The Eye of the Beholder, is no exception, as Deanna investigates the suicide of a young lieutenant aboard the Enterprise. She discovers that the suicide is connected to a murder committed when the Enterprise was still under construction, and that the murderer is still on board. I, I literally watched this episode a week, less than a week, before we're filming this video, and I... I Swear to God, I do not remember what happens. That's how uninteresting it is. The episode also advances Worf and Deanna's relationship arc, which is also touched on in the next episode, Genesis. After Dr. Crusher administers a treatment for Barclay's urodolin flu, the synthetic T-cells mutate and become airborne, causing Barclay and the other crew members to de-evolve into prehistoric creatures. While the science of this episode is highly questionable in a Michael Bay Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles sort of way, the episode still does, in my opinion, function well as one of TNG's best horror episodes. That said, Genesis does remain divisive. Less divisive is Journey's End, which serves as the conclusion of Wesley Crusher's arc in TNG. And by less divisive, what I mean is everybody f***ing hates this episode. Let me just tell you, Wesley has some pretty good moments in the middle seasons, you know, first duty and all that stuff, but like, this is just such a pathetic way to go out. He's suffering from gifted kid burnout, relatable, his grades slipping at Starfleet Academy and all the pressure he feels leading him to drop out. He goes on to become the white savior of a group of Native Americans who are being forced to give up their home as part of the new Federation Cardassian Treaty, which has created the Demilitarized Zone. God, again, talk about on the nose. I understand, but now is not the time Do you time know what they're trying to do? They're preparing to beam you away and take you to their ship. You're not going to let them do that, are you? No. 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 We won't. Leave now. I, for one, think the Trail of Tears was a bad thing. To be fair, this episode does point out the historical parallels with Indian removal, but it's simultaneously one of the most tone-deaf and preachy episodes of Star Trek, which is quite an accomplishment. As it turns out, the Traveler has been posing in red face the whole time, and he invites Wesley to accompany him to visit other planes of existence. This is definitely the natural conclusion for Wesley and the Traveler's arcs, but holy god is it rushed. The episode also includes an extended discussion about white guilt or, more broadly, the responsibility for the crime of one's ancestors, which, to be honest, feels out of place for Star Trek's future. Family themes are more competently handled, however, in First Born. A mysterious family friend and advisor to the House of Moog comes aboard the Enterprise and encourages young Alexander to become a Klingon warrior. As it turns out, this man is Alexander from an alternate future in which Alexander's failure to become a warrior leads to Worf's premature death. Firstborn is really interesting because it actually does change the trajectory of Alexander's life. We see in Deep Space Nine that he does indeed join the Klingon Defense Force. And speaking of DS9, the concept of a son traveling back in time to save his father's life is revisited in, well, The Visitor. 
Great, another family episode. In Bloodlines, Ferengi Daimon Bach threatens the life of Picard's supposed long-lost son, Jason Vigo. In order to get revenge for the death of Bach's son at Picard's hands several years ago. Jason, of course, ends up not being Picard's son, the ruse being the result of a tampered DNA test. This episode's pretty forgettable, suffering once again from the same issues as episodes like Interface and Homeward. The motif of offspring is also present in Emergence, in which the Enterprise computer begins to exhibit self-awareness and a desire to reproduce after being exposed to Verdeon particles from a nearby white dwarf star, an episode marked by an entertaining holodeck adventure on the Orient Express. This precedes the show's penultimate episode, Preemptive Strike, which wraps up Rolaren's arc as she is sent undercover to root out a Maquis cell, only to join them. If you, can't, if you can't beat them, join them. This is honestly a fantastic choice for her character, I think, as the Maquis, who are rebelling against Cardassian activity in the demilitarized zone, following their abandonment by the Federation, is one of the more compelling conflicts in Trek lore. Finally, we have All Good Things, the hour and a half series finale to one of the greatest shows of all time. After Picard is told by Q that Picard is to be the cause of humanity's destruction, Picard must convince his colleagues to journey with him to the Devron system, where an anti-time anomaly has emerged. While he simultaneously shifts through while he simultaneously shifts through three while he simultaneously shifts through three time periods past present and future why do i write alliteration in my scripts <laughs> the trial never ends indeed some of the elements of the alternate future such as picard's eremotic syndrome his retiring to his vineyard jordy's optical implants and the collapse of the Romulan Star Empire have become canon, and the episode's ending, in which Picard joins his senior staff at their poker game, has become one of the most iconic moments in Star Trek. All Good Things is, all things considered, a really strong finale and a pretty interesting sci-fi episode. Elevated above its somewhat convoluted technobabble premise by the performances of all the actors and the production design. But despite this strong finish, it should be clear that season 7 is kind of when TNG went off the rails. Even the writing staff was aware of it. Like I said earlier, I got kind of bored with a lot of the episodes in this season. So I started to multitask. I even made this painting of Tally from Mass Effect in Krita, and I think it gave me repetitive stress injury. But I have to say, while I did kind of tune out towards the end of this TNG rewatch, I was actually kind of sad when it was over, because it was over. There were no, there were no more episodes. Oh sh they made four movies! Cut to black. Coming holiday 2023. Part six of the series that's... <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. By becoming a patron or member, you get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. Links to my PayPal and my social media and merch store are all in the description. And now I want to shout out my top members and patrons at the $25 level and above. B. Kaiser 05, Daniel Carter, Herb Cat, Hero in Hong Kong, Captain Kevin Johnson, Commander Kevin Johnson, Lester Lewis, and Tyler King. And a special thanks as well to all of my top PayPal donors for this video. David Walker, Dustin Echoes, Joshua Herbert, and Kevin Johnson again. And for all the rest of you who support me on Patreon and through memberships and who donated super chats and on PayPal to help make this video possible, a big, big thank you to all of you as well. This video would not have been possible without you. I really mean that. So I appreciate you guys. And uh, like I said, hope you enjoy this. Thank you all so much for watching once again. That's all I have for this week. Live long 
and prosper. I'm rolling. What? Oh. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Uh, okay, before I totally cut, um, give me a third one, and then just hold your position. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm recoiling because I'm self-conscious. I understand. Is this a good spot? Yeah. Waiting for the right time, yeah. I gotta feel it. Also, I hate to say this, but you gotta be loud, loud. Oh, God. You could say that I'm offering the best of both worlds. <laughs> Let me do that one more time. I can use clips for that. I, I, I am really not inclined to read a lot of this. <laughs> <laughs> the emphasis on political, social, and moral dilemmas present in the, okay, present earlier in the season. This is what I go through every time I record a script, by the way. <laughs> I can't fucking remember anything. Mm. But interestingly enough, while season five was much weaker on rewatch than I remembered... <laughs> hey, buddy. See, if you're quiet, we c you can stay down here. Instead of Riker becoming acting Cap'n in a... <laughs> Instead of Riker becoming acting Cap... Instead of Riker becoming acting captain in accordance with the chain of command. <laughs> uh, we're actually getting through this at a decent pace, I think. Well, we should be finished before 1 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> but let me know if I'm wrong. Okay. No, 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 that's not, <laughs> that's not for them to decide. <laughs> that's a good blooper right there. Mm -hmm. As many have said, no, God, many people are saying this. <laughs> God, I really want this to be over so hard. <laughs> although he noted that he wished, okay, although, although he noted that he wished more had been done. This is 20 pages, man. <laughs> you might do it in your camera. Yeah. <laughs> so fucking stupid. This is things that run through my head. Oh no, I've got a. <sighs> Are you gonna do devouring here? Yeah, I just realized I gotta read all this again in the studio. Yeah, yep. You gotta read all of it in the studio. All right, this is the telepathy thing. Give me another uh, yeah. Professor X, but this time it's really hurting you. <laughs> How was <is> that? <laughs> Sounds a little more pleasurable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could say it was a dark page. <laughs> I think that um, 
th this is really accelerating my desire to move away from Star Trek content. <laughs> YouTubers with half a million subscribers leave shots in their videos that are not color corrected. Mm -hmm. Although to be fair, I don't think that this tragic event really excuses how overbearing she is with Deanna. You know, it's, it's like it's like lay off it. <laughs> I don't know. What, I don't know how to end that. <laughs> I don't know how to end that sentence. Four more pages. <laughs> Thank you, Ghost Tyler. Okay. <laughs> Tyler, he's allowed to come on to talk about one episode. Yeah. One yeah. <laughs> yeah. Less divisive is Journey's End, which serves as the conclusion of Wesley Crusher's arc in TNG. And by less divisive, what I mean is everybody hates this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just tell you, while Wesley did have some genuinely great moments, no, uh, no there's nothing great about Wesley Crusher. God, why do I put so much alliteration? <laughs> Elevated above its somewhat convoluted technobabble premise by the performance of all the actors and by the production design. <laughs> it really is like you write it and then you say it and it just, you can't. <laughs> In Sub Rosa, after attending her, her fucking grandma. <laughs> okay. As it turns out, Ronan has been preying on the women in Beverly's. Be Beverly's. <laughs> it's been a long road getting from there to here. It's been a long time. Hoo wee, it's good to be back. Hey guys. Tyler here. So, the Star Trek The Next Generation movies, we all remember them with varying degrees of fondness. Star Trek Generations, Star Trek First Contact, Star Trek Insurrection, Star Trek Nemesis, they're all somewhat divisive within the fandom. Translation, they kinda suck. Well, not all of them, but they're very flawed in ways that fans have been picking apart for over two decades. I've spent the better part of the past year analyzing the lore of Star Trek The Next Generation. I've showcased how the writing evolved over seven seasons and offered my opinions on the quality of many episodes. Towards the end of my most recent retrospective, I lamented that there were no more lands to conquer. Uh, I mean, uh, no more episodes to review. And then I remembered, oh sh**! They made four movies! Cut to black. In this video, I'd like to examine the four Star Trek The Next Generation feature films, analyzing their lore contributions and how they reflected the changing landscape of the film industry in the 90s and early 2000s. Let's get started. Before we dive in, I need to address the elephant in the room. <sighs> hey, Horton. So anyway, I have a new studio set up. So I was gonna do this little studio tour as like a Patreon exclusive, but I figured, you know, I might as well do it for my whole audience. You know, you guys have supported me this long. Here, let's, let's do a studio tour. So, you know, we've got the, we've got the Pixar corner, right, with, uh, you know, Wally and Incredibles and, you know, Disney with, like, Groot and everything. The Star Trek shelves with the, the ships and DS9 characters and Communicator and the guy. We got some little Metroid action uh, down here. Uh, and then on the lower shelves, we've got, you know, some some old toys from back in the day, you know, some some uh, from the Kelvin timeline and everything. We got uh, Blade oh, Runner. What? Uh, um, in the fall of 1992, during TNG's sixth season, producer Rick Berman was approached by Paramount regarding a seventh Star Trek film, with the original series cast having literally just signed off with Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, Paramount wanted Star Trek VII to be a TNG vehicle. Berman and studio executives felt that the outing would be an opportunity to pass the baton, and in February 1993, the studio commissioned three writers to pin a couple Star Trek stories for this seventh motion picture installment. One draft written by former TNG writer-producer Maurice Hurley had Captain Picard recreate Captain Kirk on the holodeck to help solve a dilemma involving interdimensional aliens wreaking havoc by crossing into our realm. Simultaneously, a script by Ronald D. Moore and Brandon Braga 
which was ultimately greenlit, instead featured Kirk in the flesh, as well as, initially, the entire original series cast. For a time, Moore and Braga considered having the two Enterprise crews battle each other, but felt there was no way to make this happen without one of the crews looking like the bad guy. They ultimately returned to the initial idea of a mystery that spans two generations, using the character of Guinan as the link between both time periods. It was soon decided as well that the script would kill off Kirk, which became part of the fabric of the story and there was never a moment where it came into question. Even as late as December 1993, a year before release, the film's prologue featured Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Scotty, Uhura, Sulu, and Chekhov. Early drafts also featured large action pieces that were later removed. These included the Romulan attack on the Amargosa Observatory, and a battle between the Enterprise crew and Duras sisters in the jungles of Viridian III, likely cut for budgetary reasons. Eventually, the two producers chose to pare down the appearances of TOS cast members to two select cameos, besides William Shatner. A January 1994 draft featured Kirk, Spock, and McCoy in the prologue on the Enterprise B, but Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly declined to appear, feeling their characters made sufficient exits in the undiscovered country. Nimoy was even offered the director's chair, having directed the third and fourth Star Trek movies, but requested too many script changes for the producer's tastes. The final draft script was submitted in March 1994, featuring Scott, Chekhov, and Kirk. During pre-production, Berman battled with the studio over the budget, with the film's cost cut down to an estimated $35 million. Hopes of shooting on location in Hawaii and Idaho were dropped in favor of more local shoots in California and Nevada. TNG and DS9 veteran director David Carson was hired in place of Nimoy, with the film recruiting veteran cinematographer John Alonzo, DP on Chinatown and Scarface. And as for production design, Herman Zimmerman worked with Alonzo and illustrator John Eaves to refresh the aging sets, as well as design new Enterprise locations like stellar cartography. Among the modifications made to the Enterprise D bridge were additional computer stations, raising the captain's chair slightly, adding handrails, and repainting and recarpeting. Following the end of production, most of the Enterprise's interior sets were destroyed. Filmed during production on TNG's seventh season, Generations really is a passing of the baton. The prologue echoes sentiments shared by the franchise as far back as the Wrath of Khan, namely aging and the passage of time, which are ultimately some of the core themes of Generations itself. We open aboard, or actually outside, the Enterprise B, an Excelsior-class starship, which is a modified version of the actual Excelsior Studio model from the search for Spock. Immediately as Kirk, Scott, and Chekhov step on the bridge, we are greeted by several news reporters from various Federation-affiliated outlets, an early on-screen indication that human journalists are still employed in the 23rd century, and that the Federation has broadcast news media, which may or may not be state-owned. We meet Demora Sulu, daughter of Hikaru Sulu and flight controller of the Enterprise B. Tim Russ makes it <laughs> We ain't found shit makes another appearance as a human officer aboard the Enterprise after appearing in the season 6 TNG episode Starship Mine. We later learn in Star Trek Voyager, where Russ portrays series regular Lieutenant Tuvok, that Tuvok served under Hikaru Sulu aboard the USS Excelsior herself. The prologue also introduces us to the Nexus Energy Ribbon, though it goes unnamed until later in the film and fills in certain gaps in the history of the El Orion species. The Enterprise B helps rescue 47 El Orion refugees from the starship Lakul, presumably fleeing the destruction of their homeworld by the Borg Collective. Among the refugees are Guinan, who had visited Earth centuries earlier, as seen in Time's Arrow, and Generation's primary antagonist, Dr. Tolian Soren, played by Malcolm McDowell. After Kirk volunteers to make modifications to the Enterprise B's deflector dish on Deck 15, an energy discharge causes a hull breach, 
and Kirk is presumed dead. We transition into the film's 24th century time period and see Worf's promotion to Lieutenant Commander. This sequence serves as a nice breather after the action-packed prologue, as we're reacquainted with our favorite TNG characters' personality quirks, including Data's ongoing struggle to understand various aspects of the human emotions. The, of, <laughs> I couldn't decide the human condition or human emotions. Do something unexpected. Picard subsequently gets a horrifying report that his brother Robert and nephew Rene have died in a house fire. The experience of losing the closest person he had to a son, along with Picard's experience in the season 5 episodes Disaster and the Inner Light, are instrumental in changing his attitude towards children. Data also chooses, upon consultation with Geordi, to finally implant the emotion chip Dr. Soon created for him after removing it from lore in the TNG Season 7 premiere, Descent Part 2. He even takes it out for a test spin in a memorable sequence in 10 Forward. Oh, yes! I hate this! It is revolting! More? Please. But as we see throughout the film, Data struggles with these emotions more intensely than he ever did without them. Sir, I no longer want these emotions. This becomes especially apparent as Data is assigned to help investigate the cause of the attack on the Amargosa Observatory, where Soren is running an experiment to blow up the Amargosa star. He is successful, and this alters the course of the Nexus energy ribbon, his next stop being the Viridian system, where Soren plans to blow up that star as well and alter the Nexus's course again in hopes of returning to the Nexus. You see, the Nexus itself, as explained by Guinan, is like being inside joy. It's a dreamlike realm where all of one's deepest fantasies are realized, a sort of perfect simulation of one's desires. Guinan, Soren, and probably the other 45 survivors of the Lakul were ripped from the Nexus by the Enterprise B's transporters, pulling them from paradise back into a cold universe where their homeworld had just been ravaged by totalitarian cyborgs. And Soren is doing all of this with the help of the Duras sisters, who, as you might remember, lost the Klingon Civil War a few years prior. In exchange for providing Soren with trilithium to inhibit all nuclear fusion in the Amargosa and Viridian suns, the sisters are promised Soren's designs for a trilithium weapon that could help them overthrow the Klingon High Council. The Duras sisters figure out a way to bypass the Enterprise's shields and trigger a warp core breach, prompting the crew to evacuate the star drive section to the saucer section. The Enterprise destroys the sisters bird of prey, but after separating, the saucer is knocked by a prematurely exploding core, causing it to descend into Viridian 3's atmosphere. The saucer crash lands into the surface in a sequence of shots that, believe it or not, was actually filmed entirely practically with the scale model and landscape rather than using CGI. While all of this is going on, Picard finds a gap in Soren's force field, but is not quick enough to stop his destruction of Viridian altering the Nexus's path and sweeping up everyone on the planet's surface. Thus begins the film's third act, which is regarded by many to be this film's primary weakness. You see, for the first couple of decades of the Star Trek film franchise's existence, there was this unwritten rule of sorts, something of a fan and critical consensus that the even-numbered Star Trek films were stronger and the odd-numbered Star Trek films were weaker. For instance, The Wrath of Khan, The Voyage Home, The Undiscovered Country, and even First Contact are heralded as some of the best Trek films of all time, while the motion picture, The Search for Spock, The Final Frontier, Generations, and Insurrection have traditionally been considered to have more flaws. Star Trek Nemesis is considered to have broken the even-numbered rule, which we'll get to in a bit. Now, now, mind you, while I do have issues with the odd-numbered Star Trek films, I think that this rule is a little simplistic. Generations is kind of messy, but it's a fun mess, and to be honest, I've come to think of it as one of the most underrated films in the franchise. When I was younger and watching it for the first time, I didn't really get as much out of it, but 
As I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate it a lot more, and I think that this is a common sentiment that you will find among the fan base. That said, the third act is where a lot of the film's budgetary and time constraints start to come through. While Picard's nexus is a reflection of what we can tell he's wanted for years, a biological family, Kirk's nexus is a mishmash of seemingly random, disparate concepts, including a major one that comes out of left field his girlfriend Antonia, for whom Kirk actually quit Starfleet in the early 2280s before he was called back into service. As was pointed out in Trexpertise's video about the life of James T. Kirk, Antonia must have been the biggest knockout of all time to make Kirk, the man who dedicated his life to Starfleet, literally, quit the organization that was so fundamentally tied to his identity. Anyway, Picard solicits the help of Kirk to go back in time before Soren destroys the Viridian Sun, and Kirk sacrifices himself once again to make a difference. Fun fact, the original cut of Generations had Soren shoot Kirk in the back, but this death received such a negative response from test audiences that Paramount granted the production $5 million to reshoot the scene in the same location. Now, Kirk dying under a falling bridge is also still considered by many fans to be not quite the heroic out that the character deserves, and I'll admit that it hasn't exactly sat right with me over the years either. But time travel notwithstanding, it certainly is a more humbling death than the, in some ways, cliched going out in a blaze of glory. I've gotta say, I love this movie. Every time I watch it, it just gets better and better. But I do agree with the criticisms of the third act. Brandon Braga has stated that he and Moore simply were not given enough time to fully flesh out what Kirk's nexus could have and arguably should have been. This movie leaves an Antonia-shaped hole in Kirk's past, one that provides a hearty challenge for future writers who choose to take up its mantle. But as it stands, I think that Generations is an appropriate, if imperfect, epilogue for several members of the TOS cast, but a near-perfect introduction for the TNG characters to the big screen. That's it. Yeah. All right. That's the big screen part. To the big screen. Yeah. Life forms. You tiny little life forms. You precious little life forms. We have some uh, Blade Runner pop figures down here. Um, you know, the Dune books, first three Dune books, uh, and, uh, you know, Arrival and everything. Just references to, you know, Orville, like, references to various franchises that I've enjoyed over the years. And, um, you know, so this, oh is, God, this is a really? new background. Yeah, and if you follow me over, if you follow me over oh. here, the box office success of Star Trek Generations, which grossed over $120 million worldwide, prompted Paramount to approach Berman in early 1995 in anticipation of the next Trek film installment. While meeting with Moore and Braga, Berman revealed that he was interested in pursuing a time travel story, but Moore and Braga wanted to do a story focusing on the Borg. The three then concluded they might as well do both. Time periods initially considered for the film, which did not yet have its final final title were the days of the Roman Empire, the American Civil War, and the Italian Renaissance. The Renaissance was eventually seized upon, with a draft script called Star Trek Renaissance being fleshed out. The film would have featured the crew searching for a time-traveling Borg in a feudal European village, before tracking them down to a nobleman's castle. Data would have befriended Leonardo da Vinci, employed by the nobleman as a military engineer, and posed as da Vinci's apprentice. After realizing that combining phaser and sword fights in the same scenes risked becoming overly campy, plus the fact that such a film would be too expensive to produce, the writers and producers changed the setting to the late 21st century. Utilizing lore elements originally conceived by Gene Roddenberry in the TOS episode Metamorphosis, the subsequent draft very closely resembled the final film with a few exceptions. Titled Star Trek Resurrection, this version of the film would have seen Zephram Cochran severely injured in the Borg attack on his Montana complex. Picard would take his place in history and fall in love with a local photographer and x-ray technician named Ruby, while Riker would stay aboard the Enterprise to fight the Borg drones. The Borg Queen was also not in this draft. While receiving generally positive Positive notes from Paramount, one executive felt the Borg were too weak, basically being zombies, 
leading the writers to create the Borg Queen. While the Borg Queen has been a rather divisive character, seemingly at odds with the franchise's previous portrayal of the Borg as a decentralized collective, she was viewed as a logical extension of the Borg's existing insect-like qualities. Patrick Stewart also suggested that Picard and Riker's stories be switched, and elements like Ruby and the injured Cochrane were ultimately scrapped as well. This also allowed Cochrane's character to be better fleshed out, which Moore considered to be one of the best changes they made. In his words, it said something about the birth of the Federation that the future Gene Roddenberry envisioned is born from a very flawed man who is not larger than life, but an ordinary human being. Interestingly, the casting department tried to get Tom Hanks to play Cochrane, and Hanks was interested being a self-avowed Trekkie, but was too busy with his big screen directorial debut, That Thing You Do. Still titled Star Trek Resurrection, the eighth Star Trek film marked the directorial debut of Jonathan Frakes, who recruited a mix of Trek behind-the-scenes vets as well as outside talent to bring the production to life. Robert Blackman in particular returned to design the Starfleet uniforms, this time to complement Frake's darker color palette. These uniforms would go on to appear as well in Deep Space Nine, starting with the mid-fifth season through to the end of that show's run. While I definitely have a soft spot for the prior uniforms, I really like these uniforms incorporation of gray shoulders. It's very distinct and serves as a metaphor for the gray areas that Star Trek, particularly DS9, often explore. Like committing war crimes. You betrayed your uniform! And you're betraying yours, right now! First Contact is also the first Trek film to feature the Sovereign class Enterprise E. And like generations before it, the film features a clever mix of both practical effects and CGI. Even a month after production began, the film was still titled Resurrection before finally being changed to its final form. First Contact is, in many ways, a spiritual successor to the best of both worlds, exploring Picard's PTSD and other lingering effects of his assimilation. Mere minutes into the film, we bear witness to the Battle of Sector 001, a full-fledged Borg invasion of the Soul System, where they are implementing a new speedrun strat to conquer humanity, traveling back in time to the past and preventing first contact with the Vulcans. The Enterprise is joined in combat by the tough little Defiant, Little, before Worf leaves Ben Wyatt to join his former comrades. The E follows a Borg sphere through a temporal vortex, Time travel, and destroys it in orbit of 2063 Earth but not before it can cripple Cochrane's complex. Cochrane's right-hand engineer, Lily Sloan, exclaims, It's an Eka! A reference to the Eastern Coalition of Nations, one of the factions in World War III, which had concluded ten years prior. Picard and an away team beam down to Cochrane's missile silo, where they observe his prototype warp ship, the Phoenix, has suffered only minor damage. Picard remarks about the historical irony of the Titan II rocket used in World War III to launch nuclear missiles being used instead to usher in an era of peace and prosperity. The film features a number of Easter eggs, including the emergency medical hologram, a Dixon Hill holo program with Ethan Phillips, aka Neelix, as a holographic Mater D, <laughs> get Mater D, get her done, and a cameo by Lieutenant Barkley among others. After Picard and Data beam back up to the Enterprise with a fainted Lily, she and Picard, along with Worf and Crusher, must navigate the Borg-infested ship while Data is captured and enticed by the Dominatrix Borg Queen. I am fully functional, programmed in multiple techniques. Played by South African-born actress Alice Krieger. Was that good for you? After calming Lily down, Picard explains the economics of the future. Money doesn't exist in the 24th century. No money? You mean you don't get paid? The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. While on the surface, Riker, Troy, and Geordi convince Cochran to go through with his warp flight. And you people, you're all astronauts on some kind of Star Trek. 
Hey, that's the name of the show. While First Contact is derided by some as being when the franchise started to go too far in the action flick direction, and it is admittedly easy to get a bit lost in the third act's major set piece featuring the Borg Queen's death, I still think that First Contact is a strong film for several reasons. For one thing, the action just works. I don't know what else to tell you guys. I mean, not all of these movies have to be slow and cerebral like the motion picture. Shots fired. And secondly, it all goes back to what Moore said. First Contact gives us a glimpse into Earth's past that has been hinted at, but never really fleshed out until this film. Sure, we know about Cochrane's accomplishments from Metamorphosis, and we see an example of the post-atomic horror in Encounter at Farpoint and All Good Things, but seeing the seeds of this utopian post-scarcity society emerging from the ashes of World War III and being ushered in by an alcoholic motivated by money it's poetic in a way. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. But as far as the TNG crew, well, they've got their share of demons as well. You want to destroy the ship and run away, you coward. John Luke. If you were any other man, I would kill you where you stand. The Borg are the white whale to Picard's Ahab, and Lily calling out John Luke's bullshit about having an evolved sensibility as he damn near enjoys killing Borg drones including assimilated crew members of his, is probably the best scene in the film. John, look, blow up the damn ship! No! No! In fact, I think this back and forth exchange between Lily and Picard in the observation lounge may be one of the most important scenes in the entire franchise. For as much as these 24th century humans talk about how they've evolved past petty things like greed, revenge, etc., take them out of their element and they're just as savage as humans have always been. This is a sentiment that is echoed in various episodes of DS9, with observations from alien characters like Quark, a Ferengi personification of 20th and 21st century human greed, who nevertheless is put off by humans' sometimes hypocritical, self-righteous attitudes. They're a wonderful, friendly people, as long as their bellies are full and their hollow sweets are working. But take away their creature comforts, deprive them of food, sleep, sonic showers, put their lives in jeopardy over an extended period of time, and those same friendly, intelligent, wonderful people will become as nasty and as violent as the most bloodthirsty Klingon. That's why I think First Contact is a great film. It further demonstrates that if an era of peace can be made possible by a man like Cochrane, then maybe there's hope for our species in the real world as well. But if you like that message, that technology and human ingenuity can help us achieve great things, you might have a problem with the next film on the list. I gotta take a leak. Leak? I'm not detecting any leak. Don't you people from the 24th century ever pee? This is something that, that a lot of people haven't seen before, so uh, these are Hot Wheels toys, or, or Hot Wheels models, right? And um, when I was young, I played with them like they were toys, and I broke the stands, so I don't display these in my videos. I, I broke my little ships, you know? You broke your little ships? And, um, Development of Star Trek Insurrection began in early 1997, when Berman and Paramount approached TNG veteran writer and producer Michael Piller for story ideas. Moore and Braga were occupied with their work on DS9 and Voyager, as well as Mission Impossible 2. Having found First Contact to be too dark, Piller wanted the ninth Star Trek film to be lighter in tone. He lamented what he felt was a shift in the American public's viewing habits towards darker sci-fi and wanted to shift the franchise back to the proverbial box Gene Roddenberry had put previous writers in as an intellectual challenge. For the story itself, Pillar was inspired by his own experience with aging and began to craft a plot around the search for the Fountain of Youth. This is it's starting to become kind of a trope, There's like all these Star Trek films, even some of the good ones being like about getting old. I mean, it, that that's kind of getting old. Already, from my perspective, things are starting to get off track. While Roddenberry's original vision was, of course, pivotal, as I have demonstrated throughout this retrospective series, 
TNG got better and better the less involved he was with it. And since his death, Trek has undoubtedly explored darker stories and themes, but arguably Insurrection goes too far in the lighthearted direction, as we'll explore in a minute. Anyway, in the first draft of the script, titled Star Trek Stardust, Picard must track down a former Starfleet Academy classmate named Duffy, who is attacking Romulan ships in the far reaches of space. As the crew pursues Duffy, they start to get younger and younger as they approach the Fountain of Youth powers of the Briar Patch. Berman found the film to be too fantasy-like, and the second draft also featured Picard in pursuit of Data, an element that would remain in the final film. In this second draft, Picard kills Data in the second act, but reactivates him in time to save the Federation from an unholy alliance with the Romulans. Ultimately, Patrick Stewart was dissatisfied with the script, and thank God, because that all that sounds horrible, as were studio executives. Stewart wanted Picard to be more in jeopardy throughout the script and to have a romantic interest. He was also enthusiastic about the Fountain of Youth storyline, which was reintroduced into the third draft. The conflict with Data was scaled back to just the first act, and the script introduced new villains called the Sony. <laughs> Yeah, I can see why they changed that. Victimizing the Baku, a race of children. After DS9 executive producer Iris Stephen Bear gave Pillar a negative review of the script, the Baku were changed. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's like, Michael, stop. <laughs> the Baku were changed to adults, allowing for the introduction of the character Anij as a love interest for Picard. How old are you? The Sony became the Sona and were made more gruesome, and the title was changed to Insurrection. Freaks would return to direct while Industrial Light and Magic, busy with work on Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, was replaced with Blue Sky and Santa Barbara Studios to do the visual effects. Unlike Generations and First Contact, the vast majority of the effects shots were digital rather than practical, with physical model photography limited primarily to the explosion of the Sona collector ship. At the same time, though, Insurrection used the most built sets of any Trek film up to that point, as widespread use of digital sets was still a few years away. One of these physical sets was the cave on Baku, which doubled as a cave set used throughout DS9, including as the Bajoran fire caves in the finale, What You Leave Behind. Insurrection is rather unique as Star Trek films go, and unfortunately, I don't mean that in a positive way. We open on the idyllic planet of Baku as a seemingly pre-industrial society is being observed by a Federation science team. After Data goes rogue, exposing the duck blind the science team is using, it appears that Data has broken the Prime Directive. But as we'll soon find out, it isn't as simple as that. On the Enterprise, Picard and his senior staff prepare for a diplomatic banquet with the Federation's newest protectorate, a recently warp-capable race called the Evora. This sequence is shot like the cold open of an episode of The West Wing, and I like the lore drops about the Federation seeking as many allies as they can in light of the Dominion War. Insurrection doesn't have a star date, but we know it's at least concurrent with DS9's final season. As the Enterprise closes in, and arrives on Baku to investigate why Data went rogue, Riker and Troy rekindle their long dormant romance. Worf gets a pimple. Geordi can finally see a sunrise with his own eyes. And Troy and Crusher find their boobs are firmer than they used to be. And have you noticed how your boobs have started to firm up? We find out that the Baku are a warp-capable species who have since abandoned technology in favor of this weird, hippie, new age pastoral lifestyle. Okay, they haven't abandoned technology, but they don't implement it in their daily lives, which effectively is the same thing. I'm not against toasters, I just don't have one. <laughs> but as much as I've made fun of the Baku so far, they are pivotal to both of the film's chief themes, one of which I still find detestable, but the other I find to be far more agreeable. I'll focus on the latter first. Essentially, the Federation is in cahoots with the Sona to forcibly relocate the 600 Baku on their planet to harvest the metaphasic particles in the planet's rings. 
why must they be relocated? Well, the procedure the Sona have developed to collect the particles requires the injection of a substance that initiates a thermolytic reaction, which would render the planet uninhabitable for decades. As many have pointed out, not sure why they couldn't just set up clinics on the surface, but whatever. While the medical technologies that could be created from this process would save billions, the question the film poses is, is it worth moving 600 people from their home? Picard asks Admiral Doherty, what number does it take before it becomes wrong? Invoking parallels with the Atlantic slave trade, Indian removal, and more. In theory, I do agree with the spirit of this argument, although there is a legitimate question in my mind as to whether the Baku deserve the same level of sympathy. Seriously. What? But I thought you said that you thought the Trail of Tears was a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, think the Trail of Tears was a bad thing! You see, Baku is not their native homeworld, although it is where they've lived for 300 years. The ring's metaphasic properties regenerate the Baku cells and keep them from aging, physically, past roughly their late 30s. And we find out that the Sona and Baku are actually the same species. The Sona, decades earlier, were exiled for rebelling against their parents' Luddite society. Now, the Sona aren't good guys either. They're thuggish and have subjugated other races into a caste society. Society. Plus, they'd kill their own parents if push came to shove. But the Baku, despite being portrayed as an idyllic society, really just rubbed me the wrong way. It really grinds my gears, Lois. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're not Native Americans being told to give up their lands for white settlers. They're NIMBYs sitting on a cure for cancer. All in all, I think Star Trek Insurrection fumbles its themes big time. In principle, forcible relocation is wrong, but... Famous last words. <laughs> Insurrection muddies the waters with its exploration of its other main theme, the one I hinted at earlier the horrors of technology. I can't remember where the first place was that I saw this, but for years there's been a common critique of insurrection that has lived rent-free in my head. Get out of my head! Get out of my head! Get out of my head, man! Get out of my head! Don't be with your head! Get out of my head! Put, no, no. Basically, it's the idea that insurrection is ultimately a betrayal of everything that Star Trek stands for, because the film, inadvertently or not, promotes an anti-technology message. By presenting the admittedly flawed but still pacifistic Arcadian Baku as the victims in this situation and the good guys as a foil to the technologically advanced Sona in the Federation, the film is essentially saying technology bad. Whoa. I got that out in one, <laughs> one go. Statements by the Baku about how technology takes away from the dignity of work are treated as factual truisms rather than neo-transcendentalist nonsense. We believe that when you create a machine to do the work of a man, you take something away from the man. Not to get too political, but it's one thing to comment on the alienation of labor under capitalism. It's another to say, let's just go back to before the Industrial Revolution actually f***ing liberated us from backbreaking peasant labor. I'm sorry y'all, but this is not what Star Trek is about. Star Trek has always been humanist, but also technologically progressive. It's always shown how technology can help us accomplish great things while still setting limits, like how the Borg, the pinnacle of integration with technology, are a warning against going too far, and a metaphor for authoritarianism. Those things are not contradictory, but the Baku are an oddity that kind of turns the universe on its head. Insurrection reminds me of a worse version of the Season 7 episode Homeward, in which Worf's brother Nikolai helps relocate a pre-warp society from their dying homeworld to a new planet. There's even a plot to use a holodeck environment to fool both races in each installment. Except, again, the Baku aren't pre-warp. And one of the other biggest criticisms of Insurrection is that it feels like an extra-long TNG episode rather than a proper feature film. Now, feature-length episodes can be done right, which is why I think that format and vibe works for a film like Star Trek Beyond. But Insurrection just fails on so many levels. <laughs> Thank you.
In fact, on my last rewatch of it before this retrospective, I couldn't even finish it. I, I just thought it was so boring. I got through it this time, but let me just tell you, it gets worse from here. His energetic fist should be ready to resist a dictatorial word. Sing, Wolf, sing. Here we have an equipment shelf, um, you know, we got some, uh, we got the, the, the boys in, in gold and blue, you know, the Kelvin timeline figures, um, some more pop figures and books over here, um, and uh, yeah, that's, and then here's my, my actual recording setup, you know, with my lights and my camera and mics and laptop and, and all that stuff, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that, that little studio tour. Star Trek Nemesis is one of the Star Trek films of all time. The final film in the TNG movie series, Nemesis is directed by Stuart Baird, based on a script by John Logan. It's also the first Star Trek film not to feature opening credits, which fell out of practice in most major Hollywood films by the early 2000s. It begins with a coup d'etat against the Romulan Senate by the forces of Shinzon, a clone of Picard played by Tom Hardy, who grew up in the dilithium mines of Romulus's sister planet, Remus. Shinzon has the support of much of the Romulan military, and he plans to use a Thaleron weapon to attack Earth. Hold on, I, I said Thaleron like, like it was like you all knew what that was. And he plans to use a Thaleron weapon to attack Earth. In Alaska, Picard gives a toast at Riker and Troy's wedding reception, and among the attended guests is Wesley Crusher, who's apparently taken a break from exploring other planes of existence with the Traveler. We learn that after the crew attends a second ceremony on Beta Z, Riker and Troy are due to transfer to the USS Titan, of which Riker has accepted command. But the Enterprise picks up a positronic signal emanating from B4 another one of Dr. Soong's creations on Kolaris 3. We get the now infamous scene of Picard driving erratically in a dune buggy, apparently an addition of Stewart's into the script, of, of Patrick Stewart's, not Stuart Baird. I, I, don't, I don't know what he thought about that. I guess, he, I guess he thought enough of it to put it in the film. I will always be puzzled by the human predilection for piloting vehicles at unsafe velocities. <laughs> Shinzon wants to meet with Picard to discuss a new alliance, but really, he wants Picard's blood because he's a vampire. Uh, no, it's because he needs Picard's DNA to keep him alive. You see, for those of you who've watched my channel for years, you'll know that the cloning process is very imperfect. There's a lot that can go wrong. Sometimes you get clones who think AOC wants to ban cows. I read it in Breitbart. Clones who think Disney hacked into their computer and stole their idea for Zootopia. It's true. Mickey Mouse will pay. Clones who had one hit single and won't let it die. Man, my fans loved Freaky Fast Subs. Gonna serve you all day. Free smells, free <laughs> Clones who won't stop telling you about the new epic champions you can get in Raid Shadow Legends. Not a sponsor. Clones who go rogue and threaten to derail your entire mission from the Interstellar Alliance. The list goes on and on. Where was I? Uh, oh yes, Star Trek. This film, for some bizarre reason, lowers the pitch of Worf's voice to make him sound more alien, as if Michael Dorn's voice wasn't perfect already, and as if the forehead makeup didn't do the job just as fine. I am picking up an unusual electromagnetic signature from the Kalaran system. What sort of signature? Positronic. We get a cameo from Admiral Janeway, as well as a picture of young Picard at the Academy, inexplicably bald even though he had a full head of hair as a cadet in Tapestry. Nemesis does do some things right, I'll admit. One of Shinzon's biggest contentions with Picard's point of view is that if Picard had lived Shinzon's life, he might make the same choices as Shinzon. It's the classic nature versus nurture argument bolstered by the fact that Picard and Shinzon are genetically the same person. But Shinzon is a fucking maniac, an over-the-top villain, so at the same time, I kind of don't care about his motivation. It's power and revenge, plain and simple. Shinzon, likely cloned from a hair follicle or other DNA fragment to conduct espionage against the Federation, was probably born in the 2350s. But his entire character is just 
so uninteresting that it's hard for me to stay awake. I mean, seriously. Also in the 2350s, the Romulan Empire was in isolation, so this would have been when Picard was captain of the Stargazer. I, I do not know if they gave it that much thought, probably not. And even if Shinzon himself weren't the TNG movie series Jumping the Shark, well, my dear viewers, that moment definitely comes by the 51 minute mark. When Picard asks Deanna to endure continued telepathic sexual assault by Shinzon and the Riemann Viceroy in order to gain intel. Shinzon's Viceroy seems to have the ability to reach into my thoughts. I've become a liability. I request to be relieved of my duties. Permission denied. If you can endure more of these assaults, I need you at my side. Now more than ever. What is this, the fourth, fifth, sixth time that Troy has been mind raped in the series? This is something that Picard would never do. And it just it just broke my disbelief so fucking hard, dude. So fucking hard. This doesn't feel right. Shinzon's plan is of course thwarted. His life is ended by Picard, on whom Data places an emergency transporter device that beams him out so Data can destroy the Thaleron weapon, which in turn takes his life. Data's memory engrams have been transferred into B4, but as we learned in Star Trek Picard, B4's less advanced neurocircuitry ultimately prevents Data's personality from being fully resurrected inside B4's body. An amalgam of Data's consciousness, plus that of lore, B4, Lol, and Soong is ultimately transferred into a new hybrid organic synthetic body in Picard Season 3. Marina Sirtis and LeVar Burton are on record as having said that they thought Star Trek Nemesis sucked. Sirtis, however, thought it sucked less than Insurrection, and she has since made further critical statements of Baird, calling him an idiot and criticizing him for not watching a single episode of TNG. Baird also reportedly thought Geordi was an alien and called LeVar Laverne throughout production. In fact, Nemesis was so damaging to the franchise that it, along with the poor ratings for Star Trek Enterprise, led Paramount in 2005 to cancel all live-action Star Trek projects set in the Prime Universe indefinitely, sell large swaths of props and costumes and auctions, and dialed down the production of official merchandise. It would be another 10 years before another Prime Universe production, Star Trek Discovery, was announced. In the meantime, however, Paramount contacted Roberto Orsi and Alex Kurtzman for ideas to revive the franchise, resulting in the 2009 Star Trek reboot, directed by J.J. Abrams and set in the Kelvin timeline. Despite all this, though, the legacy of Nemesis still remains with us. The 2009 Star Trek film ramps up the Romulan coup's consequences by destroying Romulus altogether, as seen in Spock's mind meld with alternate James T. Kirk. This, in turn, influenced the plot of the first season of Picard, which premiered in 2020 and features the Romulan diaspora as an analog to our world's Syrian refugee crisis. And then they did nothing with that storyline, which is one of my biggest gripes with the season. Well, my friends, that is the troublesome tale of the TNG films. <laughs> We finally made it. We finally made it. <laughs> From the flawed but promising start of Generations, to the height of First Contact, to the boring droll of Insurrection, to the crash and burn of Nemesis, they certainly tried. For my official assessment, I can confidently say that I think that the TNG movies are mostly not that great. They definitely pale in comparison to the TOS movies, which I would love to cover at some point on my channel. But the TNG films were incredibly consequential, making major contributions to the overall lore of the Trek universe and advancing character relationships. The Dura sisters meet their bitter end, Kirk's fate is confirmed, Geordi gets ocular implants, details of World War III and First Contact are fleshed out, Will and Deanna finally end up together like they always should have been. We meet another one of Dr. Soong's prototype androids, and a government shakeup fundamentally alters the course of Romulan, and thus galactic, history. And while most fans have massive problems with, in particular, Insurrection and Nemesis, at least we get to see some more adventures with some of our favorite characters. As usual, characters like Dr. Crusher could have been given more to do, but overall, these films do some kind of job bridging the gap between the next generation itself 
and the post-Voyager galaxy showcased in Picard, Lower Decks, and Prodigy. I've always enjoyed First Contact and think that Generations mostly breaks the odd-numbered rule, but if there's anything that I have to thank Insurrection and Nemesis for, it's leading Paramount to fire Rick Berman and start the f*** over. As for the next Trek retrospective series on the channel, well, I'm still deciding. I have quite a few options. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my donors who allow me to bring on talent like editors to help make more high quality content for you to enjoy. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Wee, it's good to be back. Hey guys, Tyler here. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, let's let's take a let's take a take a minute. <laughs> that's okay. a that's a good app take. I just was <laughs> I just wasn't prepared for that. And a near perfect introduction for the TNG characters to the big screen. Did my voice crack a little there? I didn't Big screen. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. <clears throat> God. <laughs> I'm falling apart. Falling apart, Lisa. <laughs> Before we dive in, I need to address the elephant in the room. Okay, I closed my eyes. <laughs> Before we dive in, I need to address the elephant in the room. Hey, Horton. Okay, he, his ears were flopping around. <laughs> I guess this is gonna be like a cadicorous thing oh, where we yeah. just like do it a million times until we get it right. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> stupid cat. <laughs> uh, uh, uh.